Hello, and welcome to the THC Show. This is the show where we talk about truth, hope, and change as we uh, pursue uh, freedom for ourselves as people and uh, access to uh, cannabis for medical users uh, is basically the theme of the show. Uh, on the show today, we will have uh, 8 out of 10 Glenn from cannamatch.ca join us for the 420 session. Uh, Jerry Martin will be here for the Martin Medical Moment. And uh, we'll, of course, be uh, having another visit at the Healing Wave Cannabis Substitution Program RV, which has uh, really become the theme of the show. And uh, we'll get to some of that a little bit later. Uh, some of the things going on in our world, uh, uh, Jesse Lavalie, he was uh, a Lavoie. He was on uh, How's It Growing show with uh, Johnny B recently. Uh, he's uh, suing the Manitoba government for the right to grow. Uh, the federal government, of course, in Canada, with legalization, has allowed for Canadians to grow up to four plants for themselves, a, a silly minimum, or a silly maximum, rather, but uh, nonetheless, uh, they're, you're allowed to grow four plants, but uh, not in Manitoba and uh, Quebec and some other places where you're not allowed to grow for yourself, and that's being challenged. So good on him for, for doing that, and uh, we hope that he has great success in that. Uh, we give him all of our, uh, our best wishes from here. Um, on the uh, legalization side, uh, over 300,000 gummies are being recalled for having mold on them. And uh, just another example of how this uh, legalization is not rolling out the way that the government uh, said that it would. Uh, that's one of many ways. But, you know, legalization was supposed to result in a safe supply of cannabis. And here we are, we have moldy weed, we have moldy edibles and other problems uh, with result of uh, you know growing too much in by people who don't really care and people who don't really know what they're doing uh, the moldy gummies were a problem that we had in the cannabis uh, marketplace a long time ago that people figured out the government looks like they're going to go through or the legal producers and suppliers are going to go through the same learning process that's already been done by people in the industry a long time ago um, a little shout out to the Cannabis Buyers Club, 25 years of uh, serving their community. Uh, Ted Smith has done some amazing work over there and uh, very, very happy that uh, they're part of the whole uh, puzzle of uh, how we're going to get uh, cannabis legalized here. I know that they've also got a big application before the federal government, uh, as do the Cannabis Substitution Project. So uh, good luck to them on that and congratulations on 25 years of continuing despite uh, much uh, oppression and obstacles. Uh, to, uh, to serve the, the needs of people who are trying to get the use of cannabis for medical purposes. Um, the, um, the Cannabis Substitution Program is also now just completed its fourth year of uh, providing cannabis for free to people to get them off of opioids on the downtown east side. And uh, we'll get into some more of that a little bit later on the show. Uh, the CBC has announced that uh, the, the researchers looking into it have found that over the last year, the amount of deaths from overdose uh, and opioid uh, poisoning, uh, fentanyl or whatever it is that's killing people in the uh, opioid supply, is, has skyrocketed uh, during the pandemic that we're in right now. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, deaths have increased significantly. In British Columbia, there's been over 100 deaths per month for six months in a row. Uh, there's a 75% increase during that time of uh, calls out to emergency call outs to, due to overdose. Uh, an average of 87 calls a day in British Columbia uh, just looking after people who are overdosing. Um, in Ontario, the preliminary data is showing that there's an increase of almost 50% uh, going on there as well. Um, and, and yet, uh, because of legalization, opioid prescriptions have declined significantly in, uh, in Canada and in other jurisdictions where that's happened. And that kind of brings us to the uh, Cannabis Substitution Program and the continuing saga of our pursuit for a, a low barrier access uh, cannabis store in, in, uh, in your community. This is a community uh, initiative, a harm reduction initiative that's been going on now, as I just mentioned, for four years. Uh, four years ago, uh, due to the overdose crisis uh, of deaths from uh, a, t a tainted uh, supply of drugs, uh, my experience led me to understand that cannabis high-dose edibles could work to get people off of opioids, to get them through the 
uh, withdrawal period that you have to go through and could replace uh, opioids as a method for dealing with the pain that they deal with and all the other issues that drive opioid addiction. And so uh, I went to uh, Van Du, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users uh, here on the downtown east side, a, a publicly funded group through Coastal Health that uh, tries to help the people that are oppressed by the drug war and are facing the, the struggles of addiction and other things. And I presented the idea of just giving away cannabis high-dose edibles to people to make it as easy as possible to have them transition off of uh, off the opioids and the hard drugs. So they gave me unanimous approval to go to city council and, uh, and ask for their support. And I did all of that. And it took a couple of months before I had enough donations to give away. I never did get uh, approval from city council at that time to start the program. It took a while. But um, we started handing out things in early February four years ago. And that grew to uh, uh, where we had hundreds of people showing up twice a week to get a care pack with four to six edibles and a couple of joints. And uh, great success in doing that. Uh, we had uh, Dr. MJ Malloy do studies on, uh, on our project and release papers as a result, showing the effectiveness of cannabis as a replacement therapy. Uh, it took two and a half years after starting the program for the city of Vancouver to um, pass a motion uh, put forward by Councillor Rebecca Bly uh, supporting low barrier access to cannabis. Uh, we met with the city and uh, under had an understanding that we would find a storefront and, and start providing that service. And it took us almost a year to rent a place because landlords don't want to rent people if you're going to be selling cannabis outside of the Cannabis Act. And at that time, that's what we would be doing. And we were very upfront and honest all the way through everything that we've done here with the Cannabis Substitution Program. We've never tried to hide anything. And so because we were honest with these landlords, it took about a year to find someone willing to rent to us. And uh, we were hopeful that we would get a license. We were hopeful that, uh, you know, once we opened up and demonstrated uh, what low barrier access meant and what, what was needed to help this community here, that the city would approve that and we would get a license. But as the story went, we uh, didn't get the license. We got the licensing department coming and uh, threatening our landlord and saying that we needed to go through the licensing uh, uh, process and application process before we could do what we were doing, which we were just continuing to do what we were doing, although now instead of offering cannabis at no cost, we were also offering cannabis at low cost for people that could afford it and that, that people that couldn't get into our program. Uh, the program that uh, had developed over time had resulted in 420 milligrams of cannabis, high-dose edible cannabis, being given out to over 250 people every four days for free to uh, supplement the use of opioids and hundreds of people that are part of our program uh, report that they don't use any of the other street drugs that they arrived and were using at the time when they joined our program and that uh, they're very happy having cannabis uh, in their lives and, and they'll tell you that cannabis saved their life. So we, we found a storefront, we opened up and started doing that. The landlord was threatened. Uh, he didn't want to evict us because he liked what we were doing here. Uh, City Councilor Rebecca Bly uh, tried hard from inside City Hall to, uh, to get that uh, stopped and to get licensing department to issue some sort of a written uh, statement that they would not prosecute him if he didn't try to evict us. Uh, and that didn't happen in time. Uh, on the advice of his lawyer, he took us to court and we were evicted, uh, given seven days to get out. Uh, that uh, was going to put the people in our program at risk. I mean, there's a bit of a story there with that whole court case as well, and, uh, and, and maybe just briefly I'll get into that, where it was a, a simple commercial tenancy dispute where we had not properly responded to the, um, uh, the letter of eviction that we got from our landlord, believing that we would get a license uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Uh, we had put in an application to the federal government to uh, give us a, uh, an exemption from the Cannabis Act until licenses could be figured out and we put, presented that on an emergency basis but time came and went and uh, we ended up in front of this judge and uh, we felt that uh, the judge should give us some time just to get that license in place and that's what we asked for but he felt that uh, 
you know, because what we're doing is illegal, even though what we're doing is saving people's lives, and the laws are absolutely wrong in this case that would prevent access to people who would otherwise use it for their own, own benefit and health and to get off of opioids and other things. And uh, he said that we were arriving in court with unclean hands, and that's why he uh, kicked us out in seven days, uh, did his worst to, uh, to hurt us, I guess. And uh, we got an RV right away. We never missed a day. We remained uh, as a functioning uh, outlet, uh, uh, an access point for people to, uh, to get cannabis, both for the cannabis substitution program and for uh, the, the Healing Wave dispensary, where we provide cannabis with at, at low price for um, people that are using it on a daily basis to get off of opioids and medical users who need it on a daily basis. They deserve to have affordable cannabis. We have uh, really good people working with us and we've been able to offer that and we've continued to offer that uh, from the RV that we got uh, right after we were evicted from here and we've now been in that RV for 13 weeks and still we have not gotten uh, our exemption from Health Canada. We did have a, a really good uh, conference call with them before Christmas time where they apologized for taking so long, it had been three months at that time and uh, said that uh, probably in early January they would have that for us uh, and, and they have not uh, since done that and we're now into early February. So we're really hoping that they can soon provide us with you know, some sort of permission from these public servants to be able to continue the service that we've been doing for the last you know, four years now and, uh, and not suffer the threat of arrest or seizure which we've already uh, been through. Uh, I had the uh, VPD show up here on Saturday. They were here responding to a complaint, they said. They mentioned that, uh, you know, because there's a number of uh, windows in the high-rises uh, across the street here, that uh, there's a number of people that would be seeing things go on at our RV, and that's likely where the complaint came from. They don't usually tell you where the complaint came from, but that's what they indicated there. I told the officer... Uh, Rudy and Officer Jordan, uh, all about uh, our journey to get to where we are here. Um, they were not aware of us or anything to do with that, although they did uh, remember that we had the big lineups at Van Du for three and a half years, and, and I explained to him that, that that was us, and this is what we've been doing, and this is why we can't stop doing what we're doing, and this is why we have to be where we are, because the people that we're helping, in many cases, don't have contact information. We, we can't get a hold of them. And so we need to be where they can find us, and that's why we're where we are. He cautioned us that, uh, as far as him and, and his partner Jordan were concerned, they were not going to get out of their cruisers and come and have a look in our RV and see if there was anything in plain sight there that they would be uh, mostly obligated to seize at that point. Uh, they, they warned us that... Uh, you know, other officers might be uh, responding to complaints in similar fashion, or, you know, maybe they would just by some other happenstance uh, end up at our RV, and that, uh, you know, maybe they're going to have a look and see what's going on, and maybe they're going to seize what we have there, and, uh, and there could be charges involved and that sort of stuff. So we've had the VPD here again warning us. Um, I explained that uh, there's no way we could stop doing what we're doing and put all of these people at risk and that uh, we have these letters from uh, from Dr. MJ Malloy, from Professor Zachary Walsh, uh, one of the foremost experts in uh, cannabis as a replacement or cannabinoid therapy as a replacement uh, therapy for opioid misuse and we have a letter from the counselor, uh, Rebecca Bly along with Jean Swanson penned a very supportive letter of us as well or for us as well and uh, they didn't need to see all of that, he said that uh, they they wouldn't say that they didn't support us and, and, and I could tell that they really did understand that uh, we were there to try to help things in this uh, community where there's a very dire situation going on here. And so, uh, you know, once again we've had to be made aware that, uh, that we're in a perilous situation here. And I hope that Health Canada realizes that as well and, her, you know, in some sort of a now, you know, timely fashion, it's already been over four months but, uh, you know, just give us an exemption. Just exempt us until you can figure out the licenses. I understand the licenses are difficult because of the way Health Canada has structured the Cannabis Act, the, uh, 
the uh, monopoly, if you will, on, on who gets licenses and, and how it's uh, dispensed and the, the layers of taxation involved and the packaging that's insisted upon and uh, all the other methods of distribution and the methods of growing that uh, have made this a very unreasonable uh, legalization that they've uh, delivered to us. And so because it's unreasonable, it's very difficult for them to do something really reasonable in allowing uh, low barrier access, easy access to cannabis. So that, that would solve so much of the issues in not only our community but the other communities that are suffering the same sort of problems here. If people had easy access to cannabis, then uh, then they, they would have an option, you know, instead of the easy option that's here right now. I mean, anywhere on, in this particular area, uh, Maine and Hastings, downtown east side, Vancouver, BC, uh, you, anywhere within a few blocks of this particular location, it's very easy to get the other drugs. It's very easy to go and buy heroin and meth and fentanyl and whatever else you want. Uh, there's guys on most street corners that are going to ask you about it as you walk by. Uh, if you don't have money at that particular moment, they're more than willing to give you credit for it. And that's a whole other business that they run is, is uh, having people owe them a bunch of money that they run around collecting as well. All that's going on here. It's really easy for people to come down here who are in trouble. People that have uh, cycled down into poverty for whatever reason. People who have suffered loss in their life and uh, are having a hard time functioning. They end up down here on the downtown east side. And one of the easiest things for them to do is access uh, some of these very harmful and risky substances that are here that uh, do definitely help them get through the night. You know, it numbs the pain, but uh, it comes with a whole host of, of other consequences. And th if they had cannabis high-dose edibles and cannabis concentrates as an option, then that's where most people would go. That's what most people would choose to do. And it would become the thing. People would know. That when you're suffering, when you're, when you're depressed, when, when you need to feel better, that um, you know, if there's a place there where you can access uh, high-dose cannabis edibles uh, and, and concentrates and the cannabis in all of its different forms, then there's a lot of relief available for people there. There's a way out of the pain and the, and the d depression and the other things that people are facing and struggling with. There's a way out of that that, that doesn't have to involve these harsh chemicals that people are using and, and risking death by doing so. Uh, the, the whole uh, thing of addiction is that it's not easy to get off of it. That's the problem. That's what's happening. We have a medical profession that is geared towards prescribing these opioids to people for the trauma that they suffer, for pain and depression and other things. That's the go-to drug for the pharmaceutical company's doctors that, uh, that we're dealing with here. And so people get on these opioid medications, they get addicted to it. And, and what addiction means is not that they have some voice in their head that tells them they have to go and get it. It's a feeling that starts to arise when you stop taking it. It's that you don't feel good at all. You feel sick. You need to take more and you know it. And that's the biggest thing with why people continue to take the opioids that they've been, they've been put on in most cases by doctors. Is that it, it's really, really hard to get off. It's not that you're saying no to a constant voice in your head that's nagging you to go and get drugs. It's that, ah, oh, we're at 419, so I don't have much more time. But the point is, is that getting through withdrawal is what keeps people on the opioids. And cannabis high-dose edibles can successfully get people through withdrawal without much trouble. And that's what we're told over and over again. And so that's what needs to be available to people to get them off of their opioid addiction. And that's what needs to be available to people so that they can deal with their pain or their depression or whatever else they're dealing with without having to turn to street dealers selling opioids because, you know, the doctors have cut them off and now they've been flagged as a drug user and now they can't even get it if they need it. And all the other things that are going on that drive this opioid uh, prohibition, uh, overdose, uh, epidemic and all the things that are going on with the misuse of opioids driven as I mentioned by pharmaceutical over over prescribing in the first place if the the doctors could have cannabis edibles as an option for people then there'd be a lot less opioid prescribing going on in the first place and a lot less trouble so it's 420 what can I say happy again to be joined by Glenn Wells 
Sliding in. Catamatch.ca. Yeah. Eight, 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 eight out of ten. Oh, uh, there you go. Well, now yeah. you're thinking. Now you're thinking. You have the opportunity. Promote yourself. Yes. Yeah. I like Countermatch.ca. Me too. I don't. Uh, I don't uh, charge people money for promoting their stuff if I like it. So, okay. we, you know, several times we have products that come along, and yes. I'm happy to talk about them if they work good, if they help people. I like that a lot. And uh, like that you know, you and I don't exchange anything for uh, Countermatch.ca, but I like Countermatch.ca. It's a very, very good idea yes. that that helps people get together. People that are, you know, lovers of cannabis. Yes, yeah, or know. just meeting people and stuff like that. And when I get yeah. some more money, I'm definitely going to get a commercial out there and make it a little bit like an e-harmony, but we'll call it P-harmony or something. Yeah. <laughs> pot, pot, pot harmony? Pot, pot, pot harmony, yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> Reaper harmony? Reaper harmony, harmony. yeah. Oh. M harmony, marijuana. Yeah. G harmony, Could be yeah. ganja. I, I, ganja uh, harmony. Depends on what, um, what uh, address you can find. There's a lot of names for marijuana. I know, eh? We could call it Ganja Harmony. I know. <laughs> so many. Grass Harmony. Yes. Grass Roots Harmony. Yes, there we go. Hippie Harmony. Harmony. Hippie. Harmony. People, people um, doing things in a, in a way that synchronizes and embellishes. Eh? Harmony. I like Harmony. Harmony is a wonderful thing. Harmony is great. Yeah. We have harmony in so much things of our lives, our balance, daily life. Balance is harmony, and har right? And harmony. Yes, they balance go very harmony. well together. Yes, they do. That's almost a, isn't it a synonym of that word? It might be. It might be. Eh? It, might be. it might be a word that yeah, it means the same. It's hard to have uh, harmony if you don't have balance. True. Yeah, and True. Uh, harmony is certainly incorporates a lot of different balancing of different things. So you're saying people who have vertigo don't have harmony? <laughs> Because <laughs> they don't have balance. Because they don't have balance. <laughs> yes, eh? I don't know. People, people suffering from vertigo could let me know if they're good singers or yeah, not. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if they got the tune. And <laughs> harmony is more than just music, but music is the best representation maybe of harmony. Harmony could be just the sound that your uh, <coughs> times are making in the wind. Oh, I have... Yeah. I, what you do? <coughs> I, need to, I need a drink of something. We need a glass of water, please. I need a glass of water. <coughs> Sal, we have any water? I got a dry catch in my throat. Ah, oh, he's got that cough. Oh, not that cough. Oh, not no, no, not that cough. The, not the that cannabis cough. cough. Yes. <laughs> you get a lot of that here. Uh, so uh, you've been having fun? Yeah, and I just got uh, added to Bob Dagley's group. Bob was on the video for Jen's birthday. Remember when we, we got added in there with I Cindy see. and them? Yes. Thank you very much. So, along with Doug and Michelle, we're now... Uh, Moderators of the Happy Camper 2.0. Very cool. Yeah, I got asked to do that today. So yeah, our manager Jen, she had her birthday recently. Yes, and it was we a great birthday. We had to make birthday. a big deal out of it. <laughs> well, you only reach 35 once, right? <laughs> Whatever year you you turn, you're only going to be that once. I know. I know. I know. That's the point, of the, joke, the point of the joke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were uh, we were very fortunate to have a few moments. On uh, Doug and Michelle's show there. Yep. And, they they uh, sent us a link through String Yard. That was, that was fun. They yep. had a really fun show. I was hanging out with Cindy there. Oh, that's so much better. Oh, that's much better. It's nice and cool, eh? Oh, man, water. Uh, I know. It could be so refreshing. So, while you're drinking that water, why don't you think, what was your best time at 420 Festival? What was the most thing that really stood out the most? There must be, a, you might probably have more than one. So many. Yes. It was the such an amazing was day every year. So I never right. missed for over 20 years. Yep. And this particular year right here, speaking of Cindy. And yeah, yeah, the 25th one, right? The 25th year where Cypress Hill yes. was, oh. the, the, was the headline. That was the last one. That was the last, was that 26? No. Was what, you 26? No, 2019. Was it what? 2019. Yeah, so that was the last yeah, one. Was it was Cypress the last Hill. one. It was the 25th well, year. Well, 2020 right? we did. Yeah, what, was, was, 2020 was, 2019, was 2019 the 25th year? 2020 was yes. Zoom. Yes, and that's yes. when Cypress Hill was there. Yep. Okay. Yep. You guys but that's scaring me that, you know, well, we're saying that, that was it. the last one that we had the big event for. It's the last time we really yes. had 420. Yes. I don't, I don't, well, we, we did I don't call last, last year's year. yeah. Zoom 420 420. 
Well, was, Health Canada called it a five million dollar fine, or the threat of. So it must have been a pretty good event. <laughs> <laughs> really? It was yeah. probably I a great we throw Zoom again, event. Five million dollar fine. They threatened to fine us five million dollars for broadcasting the twenty twenty four twenty. Wow. You can see I'm it on okay. Pop TV. It's a nice Zoom call. It has the history, 26 years of activism. Sorry to step over the show like that, but yeah. No, $5 yeah, million dollar threat fine. of fine for last year's 420 broadcast. And are we going to do it again? For the <laughs> last For the <laughs> last For the Oh, no. For last for, Just for last, last year. year. Yeah, Just last Zoom year. It's not for even, the Zoom. Yeah. yeah. For the Zoom. The Zoom not 160,000 live people and stuff. Just for us having a Zoom call. That was... Wow. Wow. $5 million. Wow. wow. Just a threat. Just a threat, but yes. it could be more than that. They just said that was one of the things they noticed. So it wasn't your only infraction. So if we stop, they win. <laughs> Let's not stop. Oh, <laughs> Let's man. see if they would actually do that. Oh, Again, man. Uh, that would be a newsworthy item if you got fined $5 million for doing a Zoom well, call. Newsworthy for you. I can't, yeah. Yes. For it them. would be quite annoying, but also there's yeah. no way they're going to win no. a case of stopping someone from broadcasting a political a protest. protest for, yeah. Insanity. Yeah. That's just them trying to so flex some muscles. I guess I would say that for all of the years, yeah. the, the, best. The, the best moment of any of the 420s, or most of the 420s for me, was when I got to, to do O Cannabis. Yes. And the few minutes before that, mostly yeah. the few minutes before O Cannabis, because as an activist, you know, you're looking for the platform, you're looking for the outlet, the way to get your message out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. What it is that you're trying to say, because as an activist, you got this burning desire yeah. yep. to change something yep. you want, and, you, and you want to try the best way to say it. Yep. You want to get the right people to hear it. Yep. And so to have built those rallies from where they were to having this huge, huge event and then to be able to have the microphone yes. for myself for a few minutes of being able to say what I want to say <coughs> before singing O Cannabis, that was always the biggest thrill for me. I really right. felt like you know, I, I had worked myself into a position where I was going to be able to have that opportunity because it's very frustrating. I mean, mm -hmm. I know how many of my activist friends would have loved to have been able to stand up on that stage and, and say something. Minutes, yes. You I know? was about to ask you, did you, would you ever had the notion to maybe say something before you're saying, singing instead? Like, oh, I do always. You, yeah, but is there anything that you ever wanted to get out there? Oh, always. Uh, always, hey? always, always. Always. Oh, always. always. Yeah. So it wasn't just the singing. Uh, I'm, I'm, unlike singing. my show where I come into it fairly unprepared, <laughs> for the 420 rallies, I would give a, a great deal of thought as to what it is I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it and yep. in the time that I had. And I'd have to posture for it, too, because, uh, you know, the time is, is short. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, they want me to get up and sing O Cannabis. <laughs> yeah. And I want to get up there and say something. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and O Cannabis is secondary to me. I mean, I really, I really value the ability to sing, sing O Cannabis. I think yeah. there's a lot in the words that I wrote yeah. that uh, provoke a lot of people to think yeah. things, you know, the sacred uh, a herb of peace and yeah. all the rest of it. Sacred weed for me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that, you know, but, but the, the ability to talk. And so the last one that we did at, at Sunset Beach... <coughs> With uh, Cypress Hill coming on right after me, such a thrill. Yes. And to be able to look out and see that sea of, of people that was just as far as the eye could see, and know that it's being broadcast around the world to millions of other people that would be watching uh, Vancouver's 420 event, um, that was the best moment for me was to be able to have those few minutes and be able to say what I wanted to say, and, and at least feel like I got to say it, you know? Yeah. Because that's the frustrating thing is you, you want to get the message out as an activist and, and to find those platforms is difficult. Those videos? Yeah, man. There they are right there, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, because I was yeah. there too. Oh, boy. Yeah, eh? Yeah. You and I think everybody else. I know. that We had the one-minute one. They got a five-minute one there. Yeah. Yeah, that was quite the day. Quite the day. Quite, quite, the, quite day. the days. You know, yes. they're, all, they're all so powerful, especially after we got the first two. Like, I started in 1999, and there was only a couple dozen people. Yeah. But then four or five years later, now I'm building a stage mm -hmm. that we're going to do our thing from. Um, On the steps, it, right? Uh, well, below the steps. Below we, the we steps, didn't do yeah. it off the, I actually built a 2 by 10 plywood stage yeah. uh, that we could use j just in the, in the area by the waterfall yeah. uh, to raise us up a little bit. Instead of being on the steps, because the steps don't 
in the front where we were, actually it was the back of it, we called it the front, on, George, on the Georgia Street side, the steps don't allow for much, uh, yes. you know, doing much. So we, yeah. we built a stage and that worked really well for a little while. And then we started hiring stage people and it just got so much bigger every year. Wow. And yeah. Well, I remember growing, yeah, and growing and growing and growing and growing to the part where we had to go to Sunset Beach. Yeah, we outgrew the art gallery. Yeah. We had to close down the streets. We had three stages going on at once. Yeah. That was hard to sing on cannabis. Uh, <laughs> three stages? On three stages. I yeah. did that once. Yeah. Uh, and well, now we I think three, three times I had to do well, Zoom. I did lots <laughs> now, of times. Now we can Zoom you in, yeah. <laughs> I think you could be a three stages. But yeah, uh, once. three times I had to go back and forth between the, the first and second stage. Oh, wow. Right. <laughs> through that whole sea of people. Oh, yeah. What's I remember Roxanne. Shout out to Roxanne. I hope you're doing well. Um, she would be guiding me through the crowd going, I got the cannabis singer here, I got the cannabis singer oh, here. <laughs> oh, that'd and be I'd crazy. race to the other stage and do it twice. But, yeah. And it, it's hard because those rallies were so noisy. Yes. You know, when, when they got big, yeah. there's like a din of noise. Yeah. So it's hard to hear yourself talk. And when you're talking to other people, you're yelling most of the time. Yeah. So by the time it gets to 420... Smoked a lot of weed, mm -hmm. talked really loud for all day. Now I don't have much of a voice. Got to get up there and sing old cannabis. Mm -hmm. So when you hear me kind of losing it at the end of some of the old cannabises over the years, <laughs> That's that, that had a lot to do with it. Yes. I didn't have a lot of voice left sometimes. And so when I had to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> that was even worse. <laughs> it was even worse. Oh my gosh. But uh, I pulled it off. Did I, you I do a little it. spray in the throat no, there? Or no, I don't know. I just you know, drink some of the, uh, the magical water. water. Yeah. So yeah, 420. Wow. I guess we're not going to have it again this year. We well, may or may not do a $5 million Zoom. I don't know. I think we should. I don't think we should let them win. If we don't do it, they win. Well, we'll do and something. And then they'll sit back in Ontario and be they all happy. And, oh, we won. We shut down that 420 festival in Vancouver. The city's going to be so happy with us. You know, like, we can't let them do that. Even if it's small. I don't even think... if it's small. Even if we're at Thornton Park, Thornton, right. Thornton Park so, right? So yes. Yes. Cannabis culture will not be organizing any sort of a, can of, uh, a cannabis event on April 20th anywhere. Okay. But I'm confident that there will be a, a, a presence at Thornton Park. Yes. Uh, there will likely be a presence at Sunset Beach. Yes. Uh, perhaps the art gallery. Yeah. And probably a lot of other places where people just are going to come yeah. out. I mean, we had 100 plus thousand people there yes. uh, for the last one that we were at Sunset Beach. All those people want to celebrate 420 on for, on yeah. April 20th. Even last year, they all want to do there, something. There were some people still there. There were some people that were looking over to say, "Wow, look at all the people who are not here anymore." Yeah. There were some people who just showed up at 420. Just so they're all out there. They're all people. They're, they're all somewhere. Yes, 420 yeah. is happening wherever you are. Yeah. Uh, we have over 700 vendors that show up for 420 here in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're all going to set up little pop up tents on 420 <laughs> we'll in, the, you know, yeah. in the park near them. Uh, they might. Uh, but I know that there will be some people, the 420 Farmers Market people, uh, yeah. Dave Hill and that group, I'm sure they're going to be doing something, something 420. Yeah. But there won't be bands, no. you know, there won't be Cypress Hill, there won't be big amplification. It'll be like the beginning again. But, uh, and if there are people, they'll probably be standing, you know, yeah, smoking four or stuff. five feet, feet apart, maybe even six. Yeah, know? well we had to do that last year. Well, for what we did do last year, Cannabis yeah. Day was alright last Canada year. Cannabis Day was better. Yeah. The 420 wasn't so good, but Cannabis Day was good. Cannabis yes. Day showed us that we can do something. Yeah, that's why I was you thinking know. that we should be able to do but something. But I'm, I'm pretty confident that it won't be organized by a Cannabis Culture no. this year, the, or, the, or the 420 organizers. It's yeah. actually a separate uh, non-profit society that was, that was formed to put on the 420 events. Yeah. And uh, there won't be any, uh, any gatherings that will be wow. organized by that. So. But maybe the next year, maybe there'll be enough Hopefully, people. Hopefully, that's what we said last year. Yeah. <laughs> maybe next year this COVID thing will be gone. We can do this again. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember being skeptical last year yeah. about this year, last year. I'm even skeptical about the variants. Are they, are they going to use that to keep us down too? Know. You know, like there's only 10 cases right now here in British Columbia, but it seems to be... I don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Stay know. safe out there, everybody. Yeah. Stay yeah. safe, stay it's, sane. And stay healthy. Uh, you know. All of that. Well, thanks, Glenn. I appreciate yeah, it a well, lot. We will see you we'll next see you week. Next week. Yes. Have a good and, show. Uh, yeah. Then yeah. it'll be it'll be after. It'll be more than four years since the program yes. started. So we'll, yeah, we you might do something. In February, right? Might do something next week to uh, celebrate the four years of the program. I'll bring a cake. All right. All right. Very good. Yeah, sounds good.
Okay. So, yeah. That brings us to the Martin Medical Moment, and uh, this is the time of the show where we talk about the uh, the real pursuit for medical access rights through storefronts, a, a pursuit that's being um, led by Jerry Martin. Jerry Martin was a, a cannabis dispensary, a medical cannabis dispensary operator in Whitewood, Saskatchewan, and he was uh, raided and arrested and had all his property seized and charged uh, about four years ago, over four years ago now. And he's still waiting to have his day in court, but uh, when that happens, we will be able to put the government on trial with respect to uh, preventing access to people uh, to get uh, medical cannabis for, many, in many cases, serious medical needs and uh, maybe getting off of opioids and all the other reasons that people might need access to medical cannabis. And uh, we get to, once again, put the government on trial for uh, not allowing that access uh, without any justification and uh, we'll see what they got this time but I know what Jerry's got he's got a whole lot and Jerry is uh, good enough to join me on the show uh, most weeks here and he's here again today so uh, come on Jerry uh, have a seat how you doing sir good and you pretty good how was the last week up and down yeah up trying to down. quit smoking yeah it's not easy it's all right. I've had bastards. like six cigarettes in five days. Well, that's pretty good. Considering two packs a day. Yeah, yeah, and at this moment, you four of them were yesterday. Okay. Two of them were today. They're all in your past. <laughs> at this point, they're all in but, your yeah. past. Yeah. There's nothing foreseeable in your future. Yeah. At this moment, I didn't even bring them with me. Yet. At this moment, you've quit. Yeah. We'll see yeah. what happens. That's, uh, yeah, we'll they're getting happens. nastier and nastier. But how nasty is that? That, that they yeah. sell this fucking product that gets people addicted yeah. to the point where it's really, really hard to quit that yeah. shit. And they sure know it is. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that be a really good reason to try to restrict the access to something like that? Yeah. Well, you, I think well, so. Uh, yeah. Like, if you're going to restrict access to something well, as got a government, limit, but there, should be, yeah. there should be a damn good reason. I don't think you're going to go to prison, though, for sharing a cigarette. Probably not. Yeah. yeah probably not. Yeah. It's a minor detail. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's easily accessible. They're just killing each other. It's okay. <laughs> Four or five million yeah. human beings every 12 yeah. months yeah. die, you know, directly related <laughs> to smoking cigarettes. <coughs> and yet that stuff's available <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, yeah. every corner. Corner that. stores, supermarkets, yeah. gas stations even. Yeah, everywhere. And no restriction on how yeah. close to schools. You know. I mean, there's gas stations and corner stores all around schools. I, probably, I don't know. Is you going to be like 16 to buy them now? Well, I don't know. Maybe, it depends on the province. I think if your parents depends on the buy province. them for you, it's okay. If your parents are boys and then yeah, it's all right or something. I, I started smoking yeah. cigarettes here in Vancouver when I was 10 years old. Uh, I stole them from, uh, I think it was an IGA. It was some sort of a supermarket that was up the street anyway. And in those days, they had them stacked up behind the cash register, behind the, not the cash register, but with the, the cashier. And so that when you were going through an aisle, right beside you on the next aisle was a big stack of cigarettes right beside you. And as soon as somebody looked away, you know, you could, you could steal them, even if you were a kid. Remember those old machines? There was machines where they had push out the I never had to buy them. <laughs> That's how we started in public schools, because the uh, Oshawa, the Oshawa, what was it called, the Oshawa Civic or something, the big arena in Oshawa, right? Ontario. They had one of those. Anyway, and there was nobody ever in there during the day, so you just go through the door and go to the cigarette machine, which was only two bucks anyways. I don't think I ever bought them out of those machines, yeah. but I absolutely remember yeah. those machines yeah. being available all around me yeah. at times, you know. Yeah. Uh, I remember we went on school field trips. Uh, we went back to the Queen Elizabeth Theater, and they had the cigarette machines in the lobby there. Uh, and, 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 and they had them at restaurants everywhere. Place. Yeah. Everywhere, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I it was a funny world back then. I remember someone trying to steal one at a Teddy's restaurant I was working at once. A couple of guys were walking out with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so cigarettes, that's quite the thing, eh? Yeah. Like, uh, we live in a world where, where you can, you know, if you're over the age of, like, I don't know what it is, like you say, it depends on the province, probably. But you can go and buy this shit. It's available. Not this. This is this is the good stuff, folks. That's what they call it. But cigarettes, you can buy that shit and uh, puff yourself to death. I don't think there's a limit on how many cartons you can buy at a time. No. Uh, you know, there's a limit on how much you can grow for yourself of tobacco. But it's like, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds or something, right? It's pretty high. Yeah. Well, I, I can't remember what it is. It's, it's quite a bit anyways. It's quite a bit. Yeah. 
And most people don't want to do that. It's so yeah. convenient to buy it already pre-rolled yeah. with, with the poison and all yeah. the addictive yeah, shit already put in there. Yeah, pre sprayed. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, they find that the natural tobacco doesn't really do it for them. Yeah. Because the stuff that they're selling uh, in stores has got a whole lot of shit in there. Yeah. Like arsenic yeah. and cyanide. And it's like heroin with fentanyl. Fuck. You need a little kick. Well, yeah. yeah you know, you know what people get hooked it's, it's on no that. Secret. It's, uh, yeah. it's no Can't secret. It's no secret that the uh, tobacco companies yeah. have spent all kinds of time and money and energy on figuring out what kind of chemicals are more addictive. That yeah. If people are inhaling the smoke from something burning, what can they have go in there that will uh, cause a craving in the brain? Right, that's you know? all it really is. It doesn't taste any good. It's really just a feeling not. getting the lungs. Oh, it's just burning when I have one today. <laughs> it's like, ah, I'm still feeling it. It's it yeah. it becomes pretty quickly yeah. about um, getting some relief from not smoking. There's yeah. something about inhaling that stuff that makes you feel okay when you're yeah. inhaling it. Well, it keeps you lethargic and keeps you down. I spend hours in the morning. Sick. Like I'm doing work, but smoke, smoke is going all the time. Yeah, so you don't get anything, you know. That I'm most last minute. I mean, they spent <laughs> decades glorifying it. Yeah, uh, having doctors advertise it yeah. and cowboys and yeah. you know movie stars and all the rest of it, um, getting people smoking it so it became socially acceptable. But my, my big query is, how the hell is that allowed to be sold like that? Money. Like, you know? It's a lot of money, man. It it's must be enormous something. enormous I mean, amount of money. Like, like the banks, they can't arrest them. They do, but they don't ever, nothing ever becomes of it except for a fine because they would collapse the financial system if they were to do so. So they yeah. can't. They can't. You make so much money. Can you imagine the outrage? The law. That's just you know, pretty, pretty much it. You know? The outrage the they tried to yeah. for, for tobacco. I mean, the outrage yeah. among smokers yeah. if they were all of a sudden prohibited, like, you know, like let's, let's treat tobacco like we treated weed for 100 years and uh, you know, send the police after you and all the rest of it. The outrage would be incredible. Yeah. Um, the ability to smuggle uh, uh, tobacco seeds. Mm -hmm. You've seen tobacco yeah. seeds, yeah. either. Yeah. Tiny, yeah. tiny, yeah. tiny, yeah. tiny little yeah. things. So, I mean, I'm sure in this day and age they have detectors for it. I mean, you could take a handful mm -hmm. of tobacco seeds mm -hmm. and just put them the up old there. Trick, yeah. Put them in your hair. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, they're there. Nobody would see them. You get yeah. out the other day, just, you know. Yeah, people think you got bugs popping out or something. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, they wouldn't like that. <laughs> the whole thing is just an example of how crazy and upside down things are. Like the truth, when you look at it with respect, you know, through the lenses of well, look what they're doing with the treatment of cannabis. And I mean, you have to only buy it through specific government stores, and municipalities can deny it, and they have to be, uh, you know, in, in the case of Vancouver, 300 meters away from each other, nowhere near schools, other things like that. I don't know what the, the regs are in other jurisdictions besides Vancouver for where these stores can be. Maybe it's not so ridiculous. But uh, then you put that side to side with tobacco and you see that, holy shit, that's available all over the yeah, place. Yeah, liquor too. And, and liquor yeah, too, pretty much, yeah. I mean, uh, liquor for sale. Maybe I should turn off my phone. You know, after all this time, I've had the seven or eight beeps now because somebody forgot to turn down the volume before the show. <laughs> And then maybe I should do that before it actually rings or something, and then I gotta answer it. And then we have like a, an unofficial guest on the show that we didn't know. Don't get me looking at my phone here. I'm backing off. There we go. All right, that'll solve that issue. So yeah, that's something that just blows my mind. I know we're not talking about the medical cannabis at this point, yeah. but uh, we are talking about the availability of tobacco in a world where the restrictions on getting cannabis. Uh, beside that are just ludicrous in comparison and yet you know anybody knows that the, the, the problems from tobacco with respect to health problems the uh, are, are huge yeah and cannabis as it turns out is kind of like medicine for people it, it helps people sleep and it helps people that have you know, nausea uh, cigarettes has made me so tired yeah, I saw I, you posted I, I, that. That was very yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm taking a nap like every afternoon. <laughs> and so, can you explain what what that article said there? You you, you um, posted yeah, something there, about there that. Yeah, there was some uh, sort of chemical uh, that, that the releases there's... in your in your body that uh, well, the tobacco can keep you awake. Yeah, yeah the chemicals just... in the tobacco that they're putting there yeah. go in and replace uh, the production of a chemical right. that keeps you alert and awake. 
Right. And so when you stop putting that in there, right. now all of a sudden you're that you're not producing right. that naturally anymore, and it takes a while for that to come yeah, back. Yeah, but, yeah. But uh, that's Plus why. All I, I guess all the crap's coming out of you everywhere. Is it? That's it. Yeah. So it's a real physical withdrawal. Yeah, I bought a bunch of exercise equipment, so I'm using the wrong machine, and uh, and that's uh, well reported, right? Yeah, and like, I got the inverse machine. I really like that. I saw inversion your place. Too. I felt like getting a membership. Yeah, I got to hook up the I got to hook up the bike yet. I got no room to put the damn thing. <laughs> well, your TV takes up too much. Space. Yeah, yeah, you need the TV. <laughs> but you got it positioned nicely, so when you yeah. do get the bike set up, well, I got TV on the wall you can now. Can ride TV. the bike and watch the yeah. TV. TV takes one wall. Yeah, that's a wall. <laughs> Yeah. Could have been a mirror in yeah. other in other yeah. gyms. It would have yeah. been a mirror, yeah. but uh, yeah. you know, and maybe yeah. there's an app you can get. It'll turn it into a mirror, and then yeah. you can see yourself on the bike. Going. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's. I don't it. want to see myself going, man. No, <laughs> no, no. no, 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 no we're here for six months. A lot pathetic. <laughs> we're all going in the wrong direction now. Yeah. That, that's what the exercise stuff yeah. is for: is to slow that process down yeah. a little bit. You know, yeah. I know you're trying as best you can. Yeah. There's no escaping it. Yeah, you know that. it'll help yeah. getting out of that basement too. At some point, you just, yeah, really you just say, I'm happy for my previous successes, you yeah. know, and I'm living off of that now. Yeah. You're not there yet. <laughs> I know. I know you you're know. not there yet. Getting there. But the whole thing of, you know, what, what you got to go through to get off of cigarettes is well documented. These things have real physical withdrawal symptoms that are hard for people to go through. And that's my point with the opioids too. And, and that's my point to Chris Beers. I know you're watching the show, Chris. I know you've stopped posting on Facebook, and I, I appreciate that because you were getting to sound a lot like a broken record. Uh, Chris is a wonderful guy. He, he was the head of the Libertarian Party in Manitoba uh -huh. there, and I stayed with him on the Freedom Tour. But, uh, you know, he's a, a fan of, of Thomas Saz and some other uh, doctors who don't have much respect for addiction. It's all a choice. You know, you're just no. choosing this, and that's all there is to oh, it. Those people. Pull up your socks and move yeah. on to a different choice, and you'll just be fine, you know? Yeah. And it, and it gives no respect yeah. oh, the, for the battles that people have. Oh, dude, I just want to fuck it. You know? Yeah, and, 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 and I know they mean well, but I just want to clock them one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially but I felt the same. Like, I'm in a mood, you know what I mean? I, I felt the same. It's so hurtful. What's wrong with you, man? Yeah, exactly. People would punch them out that have gone through that. It's yeah, like, they're already going through it, you know? And then you say shit like that. I mean, I have to tell you, absolutely, in my That's opinion, in, in my humble opinion, yeah. just me, and many yeah. times, it's just me talking, but it is about, it is about uh, making a personal choice. It yeah. is about personal discipline, about yeah. quitting habits. That's what it's all about. But, but it ain't fucking easy. It ain't, it ain't easy if there's no nothing. options. It ain't easy to, to go through the physical yeah. shit that you have to go Just through for some of this stuff. Just the sheer fucking thought of it, dude, seems like an impossible task. I know. Addiction took me for a young And it's years. not just physical addiction, but yeah. that's the big it's one. The that's mental, the one I say, man. hey, Chris, uh, yeah. come on, buddy. There's physical yeah. addiction here. There's physical yeah. symptoms that are serious that people yeah. have to get past you're treated to like be able to stop. So you can't along. stop till you go through that. But yeah. emotionally too, yeah. and he has no respect for the emotional side of addiction, yeah. right. where where people have different things going on mentally in their head, emotionally yeah. in their being, and and that keeps a lot of people trapped yeah. as well. And sure, it's it's personal choice and it's, it's self discipline to get you out of those. People trapped. But, it's it's uh, the mental because your thinking is fucked. Dude. It's fucked. Even when I got sober, I was trying to figure out illegal ways to do completely illegal businesses. You know yeah. what I mean? I was just exactly. so twisted for so long. It, uh, it took me a while to adjust to, to normal life. And man. it's all based in oh, trauma right. and pain. <laughs> Almost all of it is based on trauma and pain. Yeah. That, and, and so when people are traumatized or in pain, well... It's difficult to make good choices. I mean, you talk about just making a good choice, you know, yeah. using self-discipline yeah. and all that stuff. Well, that's one of the things that is, is a victim of all yeah. the trauma and the pain that people suffer yeah. is it's hard to have self-discipline. Yeah. It's hard to make good choices. You things and take, you know, yeah. five minutes and see how long you think it's going to take you to get from that space oh, to where he is. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's a task and it's, yeah. It is. It's mentally. So I got a lot of respect for people that are yeah. trying to go through uh, yeah. getting off of the uh, addictive behaviors, you know, and they yeah. come in all different Yeah, and then they got to work, you know what I mean? They, they got to get sober to look at 12 bucks an hour. You know what I mean? On top of that. And so how far they really, you know, that whole process seems, you know, long and, 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 and you know. I know it becomes an excuse. Yeah, there's different ways you can do I know that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lot more, but 
and, and yeah. people use it as a way out of doing things they don't want to do, and I, yeah. and I get all of that. And but still, it's a, yeah. it's a it's a struggle for people. These things do have some power because of the physical withdrawal you have to go through. They have power because of the mental and emotional stuff as well. And so we need to be very compassionate with people that are dealing with that, and we need to be careful as a society about how we educate people about those things and what sort of checks and balances we put in place to try what you got going on that's some uh wrong with an organic as soil all right mm -hmm. and so there is a need for government regulations on things and for government oversight on some things where we know there's problems and now we're back to my original point fucking commercial tobacco available yeah. for sale everywhere and and that's happening and yet the government is spending billions of dollars, it seems, on putting in mechanisms and, and regulations and all these procedures and things that are costing us all a whole whack of money. So they know how much money they're to making off the tobacco. To try to restrict the availability so they want more of money from the wheat. Wow. And they're, they're hoping for the same thing, right? Well, sure. We know that this is all just yeah. a big smoke screen. Yeah. You know, that there is no need for all the heavy regulations. What they want to do is maintain artificially high prices yeah. on cannabis. And they want to make sure they get that tax dollars. Money, money, money. But they could have done that other ways. Yeah. Much easier ways. Well, more than I the government we, getting tax dollars. I think the majority dollars. of us, uh, you know, would have wanted to pay that tax dollar and make it a legitimate. I don't mind paying thing. taxes where it's legitimate. Yeah. And it's legitimate in two ways for me. In one way, tax is legitimate if there's some behavior of mine that's costing society money that needs to be covered by government uh, covering, you know, fixes it, and that costs money, so therefore, you know, I should pay my share in that. Um, and, and the other one is, is that taxes need to be reasonable. They need to be put onto things where there is that, so that in the case of cannabis, there's no harm coming to society for right. people using cannabis. Right, they're to use the money from that tax collected for that purpose. You would think. That, uh, that's, that's what the, makes sense the to the me. idea behind a tax. Uh, and when people are using they, cannabis, they're using less alcohol. They're, they're less violent, less yeah. prone to violence than they would be. Yeah. It's a medicine sleep. for yeah. people, so they're sleeping better. And a healthy yeah, person is a more less chill. costly person. Yeah. So all of these things are a benefit to society. It should be subsidized. <coughs> it shouldn't be taxed. But, uh, yeah, the government is in there. Going, and, and Larry Campbell was a big part of that, too. Larry, I don't know, brother. Come on. You, you never admitted to smoking weed, and I know you were smoking all the time, Senator. But uh, that's not the issue. The issue is you kept saying, tax the hell out of it. Let's make it legal so we can take all the money from the people that are smoking it. And that's not reasonable, and that's not right. It shouldn't be taxed to the max. And, and that's part of why the prices are so high. I believe Margaret was supposed to go to mental health, but I still don't recall ever seeing a dollar going to mental health for some reason. Out of any, I don't know what so they're I don't doing. Think they're making, yeah, I know they're making money off of taxes. They must be. Well, but on the books they oh, say they're yeah, losing yeah. money. Well, you just was. Just yeah, I got my own. Yeah, some random, no, random was, Romulan. Uh, yeah, no, I just brought a couple and. Um, so maybe we should talk a bit about uh, your pursuit of things. Has anything changed much? Uh, you, know, you got a court date coming up on April twenty fourth to sixth or something like that. Yeah. And then uh, that's just. Still there, that's it, nothing Still new. there, yeah, I really don't know much about it yet. Um, okay. It's coming up quick, though. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, so I hope uh, we start yeah. working on it soon. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm I mean, a last minute guy, anyways. Less than 100, it's not less like than 100 I need days. To, <laughs> it's not like I need to make up shit or, you know what I mean? I'm just going to tell the truth, so. And the whole gist of that is, <laughs> is that, you know, Jerry ran a, a medical dispensary in Saskatoon, or Sask, not Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan, and Whitewood, Saskatchewan, uh, it was raided and shut down as a result of legalization, you know, and the shutting down of illegal shops, rather than just give him a license because he already knows what he's doing. He's been doing it for four years and serving the community in very good ways, I'm sure, as any businessman would that had been responding to the needs of the community for four years. But rather than just, you know, include him in legalization and, and license what he was doing, they shut him down, arrested him, told him to stop, and eventually came in, arrested him, shut him down, seized his property, and kicked him out of town, essentially, and had been hanging over his head ever since the threat of prison for quite a while. I think that might be off the table now. That'd be very good. Well, no, but, it's not uh, off the table. Not but, off the table. Uh, but not my lawyer bigger. seems to think it's, geez, you know. Like, unlikely. I, yeah. I, I, I don't think he's ever getting his day. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Prove me, so me wrong, like, federal government. Bring him into court because he's going to kick the shit out of you because of what you've been doing. Because the whole gist of it is, is that you're challenging them constitutionally on a Canadian's right to be able to access cannabis for medical purposes through a storefront. 
and, yeah. and through a low barrier uh, uh, access because you know many people can't afford it or don't have yeah, da, 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 da. so that's what's going on this is what this is all about yourself and Pat Warnicky um, others involved perhaps you know, know, and are Paul and Josh I can never remember his, his name. I've always seen it once Paul and Lewin is the lead yeah. lawyer at yeah, uh, Weyburn at Weyburn at Weyburn yeah. and so that's going to could it go to court to this coming April they say we'll see and uh, you know that's what's going to be on, on, Zoom, on trial probably there. which really sucks oh yeah you don't get to be in a courtroom yeah and, you, you know, yeah, I don't want to be there. In fact, in my experience with the courts yeah, recently, I want to look that, him in the eye. Yeah, in my experience yeah. with the courts recently, is that you don't even get to look him in the eye. Yeah, that it's not even Zoom. Yeah, it's uh, it's an audio call oh, with, yeah. with a judge in I chairs. remember being in jail and bring in the room. And you know, sit you on your, you know, and you get your video call denied. Denied. <laughs> Or it's uh, or it's yeah. adjourned, seeing three weeks. It's like, what, man? I don't got money for bail. <laughs> you know? Now you're bringing yeah. back memories. I was in Edmonton uh, jail. Oh, I was in there when it was rated uh, Canada's number one worst jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was in well, the holding tank uh, underground yeah. uh, downtown Edmonton uh, on a Friday night after yeah. being arrested at a rally that zoo. I put on in the park. The zoo, they call it they the call zoo. They call that the zoo. Dude, there's always surprised. somebody getting knocked out in that place every single time I'm in there. The, the, uh, it's messy. the uh, watch commander, he yeah. came over and sat with me for a minute and he said... The magic room. It's the magic said, room, they call it there. He said, so, Mr. Magnuson, I want yeah. you to know that... Then we know the difference here between the real criminals and the yeah. bot people, and yeah. uh, we treat them accordingly. And I thanked yeah. them, I thanked yeah. them for that. Uh, they were pretty good to me oh, there. Cool. Uh, they got me. A, it wasn't a Zoom meeting, but it may as well have yeah. been because there I was taken into a little room there, had yeah. the, the the screen right there. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's the old the, judge yeah, with the big red nose, you know, yeah. and the saggy eyes, and and he's there late, like like one thirty in the morning yeah. on a Friday night, yeah. and uh, he's going to determine whether I get released or not. Yeah. And it was bail that really got me there because he said the bail would be a thousand dollars, and I was I couldn't stand actually in front of him. I was I was on the floor, basically sitting, kind of laying on the floor because I have a really bad back and I'm not able to deal with sitting on hard concrete benches for all the time that I'd been yeah, in the cell yeah, there. Make comfortable. And I, I could not stand. I just couldn't. Yeah. And I apologized right away to him for that. But then he wants a thousand dollars for bail. And I said, no, man, I don't have a thousand dollars. I don't know. I would never. I wouldn't have a clue how to get that. Yeah. And uh, so he uh, says, well, just hang on a minute. And then he, he does something else to the side. He comes back, and it, it was like three hundred and fifty-two dollars or something like that. And that's how much money I had on me that they yeah. took off. Oh, they get every dime, man. <laughs> so they took Sorry, it off. Sorry, can't take a bus home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I ended up on a bus anyway, huh. and uh, because Yo, they, sometimes they'll give you a bus ticket just to get you. No, I don't know how I got on. I mean, I, they, <laughs> they didn't take every penny, yeah. I guess. I mean, yeah. I, I did get on a bus eventually. Yeah. I mean, I was released after two o'clock in the morning on a cold yeah. Friday night downtown Edmonton with no jacket or anything. Yeah. Uh, they gave me a schmock, a, a chef's schmock yeah. that they had in the Lost and Found. Yeah. Uh, the officer that yeah. brought me upstairs. Um, he said to me, you know, we got to know each other a little bit. He, he's the one who processed me to get my belt and my shoes back and the other things. And when we got up top, he lit a cigarette and he said, Neil, um, I got to tell you, I've smoked weed all my life. He said, all my friends and family yeah. smoke weed. Yeah. He said, I wish you all the best in what you're trying to do here. Yeah. I mean, that really touched me for sure. I was in tears with that. I made a quick uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, video blog for POT TV because mm -hmm. of that. I said, I'm, I'm going to tell my blog tell what you said. Uh, I said, I'm not going to use your name guys. because I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to report right now on what you just said to me. And we had a video camera. Mm -hmm. and I had a video camera or something. We did that right away. So, yeah, th that well, was very interesting. Yeah. And one other interesting thing in that is, is that um, I had a license by that time to possess cannabis, uh, thanks to Jade and, and Yan in Manitoba, doc the doctor there. And so uh, when, when I did get my car back, I tried sleeping in a couple different places. I tried crawling underneath the, uh, the uh, tablecloth at a fancy hotel in, in the main lobby there, but they found me and dragged me out of there. And, uh, I went to the bus depot to try to sleep, but those chairs are not oh, designed dude, for sleeping in. The bus oh, they do not make it yeah. easy to sleep on those I chairs at all. Life at all. Man. Oh fuck! So I ended up on a bus, and I'm Give just driving around on a bus, <laughs> and uh, I find out where my vehicle has been towed to. Uh, they they arrested me after putting on a rally at a park in in Edmonton, and they towed my vehicle away, so it's in impound. 
And when I get there, and, and the, the attendant, he's walking me out to my vehicle, and he says, uh, he said, hey, man, there's a bunch of drugs on the seat of your car. Why would they leave them there like that? <laughs> and I hadn't seen it yet, but I said, well, because they're mine, I guess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and sure enough, the cops had taken all the weed that they had found in my stuff, and they had it all nicely laid out on the front seat of my car, of my van. So that was really cool that they did that. You know? yeah. Lots, lots more than I, I should have had. When we were kids, we used to hot box this old mini, <laughs> like six of us, in this little thing. Yeah. Uh, anyways, we're in the, one of the back roads in, in Langley, and we see this car. It's over there. So we dropped the two joints, right? Like on the, you know, right below me. But he comes over and searches the car, and they're right beside each other. And he picks one up, and he says, don't lie to <laughs> <laughs> and he drove in this guy looking like a total stoner. <laughs> and he, goes, oh, he drives away. You see him go park over there. <laughs> you know, damn well. Oh man, that's funny. Yeah, shit. it was funny, man. There was there was a couple yeah. of guys in the white spot. I think I told this story before on the show that uh, my son and I were there, and this great big huge VPD oh, and another VPD. Yeah. They came in at the same time, and we sat down. And then uh, we decided what we wanted. They they ordered exactly what we were ordering. We were all we all ordered the same food, and so we teased a little bit about that. And then you know I got up and talked to them a little bit about what was happening with us here. And uh, it came up that the RCMP I think they have to wait 30 days between smoking weed or ingesting cannabis and their next shift. And uh, with the VPD, it's eight hours. And, and oh, yeah? And he said oh, that. Yeah. And you can just see the gleam in his eye there. No it's, wonder uh, they're starting to get a lot nicer around here that I know. It's, they're all fried. <laughs> Absolutely a better choice for law yeah. enforcement than alcohol, for I sure. I see them hand their socks now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, straight up, man. I see yeah, you know, a nice and And I sell them, too. And I normally don't, they know... I get a penny, but I make sure that I go out of my way and I say that's that's good in you. Yeah, yeah, I do that too. Yeah, yeah, I, I want good cops. Uh, I wish yeah. we had that, uh, you know, across the board. If it wasn't for prohibition, yeah. I think we'd have a lot better cops than we do, uh, for two yeah. reasons. Uh, one that, uh, you know, they're not appreciated very much in their community mm -hmm. because you know just about everybody's yeah. got something that's illegal on them, yeah. you know, in some some form, and they're afraid of them. But the other one is is that they're so prone to corruption that it's so easy to be corrupted as a cop because there's all kinds of opportunities there to turn a blind eye, there's money floating around. There you, is, and the know. majority of them are doing it, so nobody else wants to be ratted on, so That's you gotta right. go with the flow. That's which, right. That's part got, of the code uh, there for sure. You got the gang pressure on you. They just arrested an RCMP officer uh, just the other day. Uh, found, uh, uh, and yeah, he, he'd only been for less than two years. He was yeah. still on probation as an RCMP officer. There was a suspicion of him I guess he'd been under surveillance for a mm -hmm. while, but they caught him in a car with a bunch of other known gang members. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, you know, we'll see what that was all about. Yeah. But you know, there's a lot of that that goes on, and and we can't, and, and everybody knows it. I mean, yeah. there's corruption that goes on. You're groomed and, for it, man, to get into that. It, top, it's man. just yeah. the environment. Yeah. Of of, of, yeah. of of prohibition. Yeah. You know, when, when there is yeah. all that money involved, there's yeah. all these people involved. There's all that ability and opportunity. Yeah. Uh, as soon as they get in trouble for money... Yeah, yeah if they didn't need to rob shit for drugs, well, crime would be a lot less, and then they could focus on just being nice. Do you think they may have been setting that cop up for undercover work now that he's on the news as being a bad cop, that he yeah. could be somebody who's undercover, yeah. and they, all the criminals will know because he was on the news? Yeah, no. You never know he's about not it. He's, he's not trusted either way. He's no, young, right? He's nah. Uh, they need to groom him. Nah. No, they're smarter, we're smarter than that. <laughs> well, you, you never know where he ends up, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, you want to take your chances, you get. Yeah, we're well, going <laughs> to say cops will purposely put a story out there. Oh, yeah. In order to make it that. But he was uh, already a cop. Yeah, but only two years. Probationary. Yeah. He's yeah. just starting, so maybe they're grooming him to do I don't trust him. I'm not undercover, yes. Right? I, I would not trust him. I don't know. I would watch some <laughs> American cop <laughs> shows, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's just the world we're living in, and it's unfortunate, and we can solve a lot of it if we actually were to legalize cannabis properly, end prohibition, uh, stop all this stuff that's going on with legal weed and illegal weed and all of that. Just get government, get the fuck out of there. Uh, the biggest one, of course, with us is that cannabis works to get people off of opioids, and we're here trying to do that. That's what our biggest mission has been for myself and the group that I'm working with for all this time. And, uh, you know, we need government to either help and support us, which they really 100% should be doing. Uh, we are doing the right thing in this community. This is the right 
great thing to be doing. But if they can't support us, they should get the hell out of the way. They should really, like, yeah, you know, get out of our way. Stop threatening Pull us. Pull Colorado. Let the people have their way, man. Make it zillion in taxes, you know. Exactly. I mean, what's wrong they with just that? passed the four billion mark in taxes yeah. there or something. And I don't get it. Stuff, you know, I just don't get it, man. Well, because yeah. the, I, I kind of do, but it's time to stop it. Yeah. You know, it, it this is wrong. Well, it's clearly more For profitable me, it's, the other way. But profit is the thing. Yeah, there's, it's a, it's a there's, there's all, that. There's, yes. there's all the because it's because you're gonna shift. You're gonna shift where the money goes, and yeah. that's the thing. Is there's a lot of money involved yeah. here, yeah. and there's been a lot of money involved in yeah. prohibition for a long time. Yeah. So a lot of these groups have been getting their piece of the yeah. prohibition money. They don't want to be the big, and uh, they don't want that yeah. to end. Yeah. And they have leverage. They have yeah. power because they've been getting a lot of money for a long time. They're they're well leveraged. They're well connected groups. They've been dealing in prohibition for a long time, so they don't want to let it go. So they're the and and, and not to mention, and there's a huge. Not to mention group of those people that are just profiting from prohibition on its own because they have products that would be interfered with if cannabis was allowed to be a medicine and a fiber and all these other things. I mean, it is a fiber, but prohibition makes it a very expensive fiber. But all of that stuff, that's not who I'm talking about. But they're there too. The pharmaceutical companies, the oil companies, the people that want to keep cannabis down because yeah. they've got competing patentable products. Right, yeah. I'm talking about the people that are out there with the, the drug sniffing dogs and they've got the new machines for testing if you're impaired and, and the cops and the, and the people that operate the courts and all of these groups. They've been making money off of the whole rotating group of people being arrested and brought through the system and yeah. all the rest of it, the people involved in the enforcement, the people involved in the, in the, in the penalty side of it, all of those people, they don't want to lose this cash cow. Yeah. So when legalization comes along, they're the stakeholders who get to sit at the table and decide on how it's going to be rolled out. Yeah. Well, they managed to get our public servants to roll out legalization to supposedly satisfy the cannabis community by at least having stores where you can buy it but at the same time they can keep all of these people involved in prohibition employed because there's still a huge part of our Canadian society that's going to be involved in the underground marketplace because even though Trudeau said that one of his main objectives was to get rid of the underground marketplace by having low prices mm. so people wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't you go and buy really good weed, really, really cheap at the corner Fresh. mom and pop store that the Fresh. government approves, you know, yeah. instead of some guy in a basement yeah. suite that's got some shady weed that you never know, blah, blah, blah. Of course you would yeah. eliminate a black market if you actually did that, yeah. but instead they did the opposite by maintaining higher than prohibition prices and making sure that the underground market continues to thrive so that it can well, be easy an fucking for you so lost. Yeah, well, it's like yeah. shooting fish in a barrel for them. Yeah. You know, to, to have people growing weed and, yeah. and selling weed. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's been such well, an easy cash cow. Well, we always fish barrel. We don't know, we're just sitting there chill, right? You don't run away or nothing. I know. <laughs> we're yeah. easy pickings for these fucking prohibitions. I've tried a few times. So, you know, this is legalization is, is we're going to keep all these groups that have used their leverage and their power to bribe and threaten us into making sure that we do. We're going to keep them all happy and we're going to try to keep the cannabis consumers happy, but we really don't care about them. And we certainly don't care about the cannabis activists. We fucking hate them. And so our, our plan will divide them also right down the middle. It'll confuse the whole populace as to whether or not it's legal or not. And the mainstream people who aren't really educated, they'll be so confused, they'll be telling the activists, well, what are you still fighting for, man? Weed's legal. Oh, and for so, sure. you know, this is all big part of a scheme yeah. that they de devised because we asked for legalize and regulate, and this is how we got it. And it's not being done fairly, it's completely wrong. This is, this is an abuse of power, but it's racketeering by our government. It's, it's a exactly protection it racket that they're running here. It's yeah. as immoral as hell. Yeah. It's still killing people, hurting people, uh, pre preventing access yeah, to a, a valid medicine, yeah. destroying families, yeah. keeping people addicted to opioids by not allowing easy access. All the things that are, are the, the consequences of this prohibition that are horrible and costing us a bundle in human emotions and money and all the rest of it is all being propagated because of a corrupt government that is doing what they're doing. That's what we're fighting against. So. Yeah, that's why I'm here. That's what the show's about. That's why you're here. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We're going to fight these bastards and win eventually. Fuck them. Fuck them.
Um, you know, Glenn was saying earlier that, uh, you know, we can't let him win with the 420 rally. Well, I don't know about the fucking 420 rally. The, the, uh-huh. big, the big enemy there turned out to be a, an, an invisible virus uh, more than, more than right. governments. They couldn't shut us down. Yeah. But uh, I do know about the whole uh, movement or cause or whatever you want to call this of, of trying to get uh, cannabis freedom for people proper reasonable access to, uh, to sick people, low barrier access to poor people and other people, but freedom in general, that fight, that's not going away no matter what. That's for uh, sure. You know, that's for damn sure. And, and if we can't fight them with, uh, with rallies where we gather over 100,000 people together, uh, we'll, we'll fight them in the courts even if it has to be through... You know, on the street. And, well, in the street because yeah. there we are with the RV still, yeah. still going strong. And, you know, they've threatened us again. I mean, yeah, you were saying that. Uh, yeah, VPD in. were here on Saturday, yeah. uh, said they were responding to a complaint. Mm. The timing was really good, really, really good for us. I was just arriving with a whole bunch of donations. And I want to give a shout out, actually, to the um, uh, Cannabis is Harm Reduction Group that uh, provided us with a, a huge amount of clothing donations that, uh, that we're going to be boxes, uh, helping people get there. And, and that's, that's just so cool because we will use it to help our project and to help the people on the downtown east side. And I really, really appreciate that. So uh, at, at Cannabis is Harm Reduction, I think is how you find them. Uh, it's a group of, uh, of, of women, actually. They describe themselves as a group of women that have come together to uh, facilitate the, the whole uh, movement towards using cannabis as a harm reduction tool and for medical purposes. So great, uh, great thanks to them and, and a real big shout out for that. But, uh, yeah, uh, what, was I, what, what led me to that? There was some, some point. Uh, talking about fighting, we, in really fighting in the streets. Fighting in the streets. Yeah, exactly. that example. That the street. VPD yeah. were here, and I was just unloading a box from my car of the clothing donation that we got, and uh, the VPD pull up into the lane here, which they do lots, you yeah. know. And I always wave at them or nod at them, or if the window's open, say hi to them. Yeah. And, uh, and in this case, the window was open on the driver's side there, and, and I said, hi there, how are you doing? And he says, not bad, how are you? And I said, pretty good. And, you know, I said, uh, pretty funny that we got this donation here for reasons I won't mention at this moment. And, uh, and then he said, oh, so you're to do with this RV? And I said, yes. He said, well, and the other guy in the other seat, it turns out his name's Rudy. Uh, he said, uh, can I talk to you for a minute over here? So he said, so you're the registered owner of this vehicle? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, we've had a complaint that there's drugs being sold out of there. And I said, well, that's kind of funny. You know, it depends how you look at that. Uh, we're here to help people get off of the hard drugs, and we've been doing it for a while. And we're the group that were at Van Du for three and a half years. You might remember us. We had the long lineups twice a week of giving out care packages of high-dose edibles. And I told him the whole story of the whole journey to get to where we are here and how we ended up in the RV. And so they were very, very sympathetic. Um, he said, well, I'm, sur- I'm not going to tell you that I don't support you. <laughs> that's, that's the best thing oh, to do. So nice, nice double measure there. Uh, he said, uh, you know, and, and I talked to him for a long time. In fact, uh, I, you know, I always give it all I got. You don't often get the ear of a, of a policeman. It's hard to do. Yeah. And I want them to understand what's going on here properly so that they can make a, the right decision to support us and not enforce against us. And so I did that. And, uh, and at that point, he said, you know, I, I said, I would, I'd like to say something now. You've, uh, you've had the last 15 minutes. He said, I feel like I was at my dad's house. <laughs> so, uh, so then he said, you know, well, from our point of view, um, you, you best not be doing anything illegal out of there. And, uh, you know, we're not going to get out of the car and go and have a look in your RV and see if there's anything in plain sight that we would be obligated to seize from you. Um, but uh, I can't tell you that uh, there's not other officers that might get a complaint and show up here and not have the same attitude as I do. Uh, he said there could be just, uh, you know, officers happening by even not without a complaint that would see something going on and, you know, it might happen that way. Uh, he also said um, that he wasn't aware of but couldn't comment on, although he just did by saying he wasn't aware, but he said he, he wouldn't know if the uh, drug squad was doing an undercover investigation on us or if there was attempts to shut us down. Because I told him, you know, I said we were raided already once by officers who wouldn't even listen to my, my explanation of what we're doing here and why we should be left to do it. Um, and uh, he said that, uh, I said, we live in fear every day that we're, you know, we might get you guys here stealing our stuff again and perhaps arresting us and taking my volunteers and my staff away. 
So, uh, you know, we're living like that. Um, I asked him if he could maybe make a call to Health Canada to ask them to hurry up with our exemption. <laughs> <laughs> he said that they weren't allowed to do that. That, uh, you know, for the police to advocate for uh, some illegal thing to be allowed, you know, is not something he'd be allowed to do. I said, well, you know, you, you, you might I understand that we're that. here trying to help people. I mean, I don't know. Is that cops for drugs? What are they called? Cops for drugs? Yeah. Leap. Leap. Yeah. Law, en law enforcement against prohibition. Yeah, why well, some of them active or? Very few of them were active. Yeah. And the ones that but were active, the ones that were active had to be careful about their yeah. activity with right. Leap. Uh, they could. They they did. Uh, David Bratzer, who was who was probably still an officer in Victoria, um, you know, he had some questions to answer and some light treading that he had to do to, you know, to be able to do what he did. But uh, he was a supporter. Most of them were retired police, and they've now changed. Eh? So Leap Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, uh, started by Jack Cole, uh, down in, in the states, uh, attracted a whole bunch of uh, mostly retired law enforcement around the world. They advocated for sane drug policy and ending prohibition and, and spoke about all the evils of prohibition from the police's point of view. But then uh, they got, uh, they changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack uh, quit in disgust, along with many of the founding members uh, that were there originally, that uh, quit in disgust because uh, they changed their name and they changed their focus. They still maintain that they have progressive policy with respect to drug reform or drug policy reform, but it comes in the form of supporting the type of legalization that we have here in Canada, where it's not real legalization and it's just a big cash grab by corporate forces. And so LEAP changed to Law Enforcement Action Partnership, which is very vague uh, and uh, yeah. doesn't mean much. And uh, they advocate for many different things within the community that aren't involved in the, in reforming drug policy. And so, yeah, it's uh, the funny thing about it is is that I was one of the founding members in Canada of that group. I'm not law enforcement, never was, but as a as a civilian member, uh, I was asked to sign, be one of three signatories mm -hmm. to. Uh, incorporate them into as a Canadian entity. So I did that. Oh, wow. And yeah. I, I went to, on uh, on tour with the Freedom Tour and part of my mission was to go to all the police stations that I could find with the, the fancy LEAP handouts that they provided yeah. and talk to the uh, the people there about, you know, prohibition from a policeman's point of view. So that was all part of that. Uh, I'm the one that uh, uh, started the Facebook group for LEAP. So on Facebook, the, the LEAP group, I'm the admin, myself and Alison Merton. Alison uh, Merton, one of the founding members who was also not happy with LEAP changing their direction. And so uh, right away when they changed their direction, I put up a post and I pinned it to the top that, <laughs> <laughs> that says, it's <laughs> that says it's very unfortunate. <laughs> Very unfortunate that Leap changed their direction, mm -hmm. and it ends with you know we as the cannabis community can no longer support them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, and that's been there for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also that I get to be the one to uh, you know uh, agree to new members, and the picture on the front of the Leap page is myself uh, uh, talking to some OPP member in Ontario, uh, you know, with my, my satchel on and the leap hand out in my hand. <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and I get the people saying, hey, what's that picture about? And I go, oh, that's the like freedom tour. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what it's all about, is, you know, what, what should be the, law, the yeah. role of law enforcement yeah. in a free country? And, uh, you know, what should they be enforcing and not enforcing? Yeah. And certainly get the prohibition on, on any drug is not something that should be uh, enforced by police. Um, you know, police are there as peace officers. Yeah. Right? That's what they're supposed to be. And prohibiting substances is not fair to police. It's not fair to society in general. Uh, prohibition gets people's attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, it uh, results in an increase in demand. Once there's the attention of the populace on, hey, the government says you can't do this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, fuck. everybody wants it. <laughs> fuck them. Uh, well, not everybody. Yeah. Not everybody. Yeah. It's a it's a percentage, yeah. but that's a healthy percentage, yeah. and it's not fair to those people. Yeah. It's not fair to me. Probably wasn't fair to you. You no. know, I don't know if you have that same rebellious gene. Oh or yeah, you know? yeah, probably. Yeah. Eh? yeah.
It wasn't fair to me to tell yeah. me I couldn't drink alcohol. Yeah. It wasn't fair to me to tell yeah. me I couldn't smoke weed. Smoked my first you joint know? in a church, dude. Did you? Yeah. Well, I certainly <laughs> tried, smoked some in Tried there. to roll an oil paper. I didn't know he had to put the tobacco in what there. What were you doing in church? I fucking thing to let What were you doing in church? <laughs> what were you doing there? Huh? Oh, my God. I grew up in church, dude. Like Did six, you? seven days a week. It was six and so seven days a week. Dude, it's why I grew oh, up man. in trouble all the time. Man. I see. Yeah. Like a preacher's kid. I had my kid. own fucking rope. You were like a preacher's yeah. kid. No, no, no. The preacher's well, kids all had to stay away from me. Well, <laughs> but, you know, preacher's, kid, preacher's, preacher's kids go that way. Preacher's yeah. kids yeah, many like times the, go that way. Yeah, it was, and for it them, was it's not, a six it was, or seven day. It's, you know, it's a whole much. life. It's so an goes, everyday it's thing for them. Career, but yeah, no, it was not good. A lot of kids rebel against that for yeah. sure. And, uh, well, I almost preachers. did all my first shit in church because it was there so much. <laughs> my mom was a Sunday yeah. school teacher. Yeah. But both my mom and dad sang in the church choir. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, I went yeah. to church every Sunday. Not much yeah. more than that. But the odd time, there'd be a weekly prayer meeting or something. Sometimes at my parents' house. So yeah, it was all there for me too, yeah. and I certainly rebelled yeah. against that and other things. And like I say, it's not fair yeah. to do that to, you know, to yeah. a young person. Yeah. To you know, I drank like a fish. I should burn in hell. <laughs> I should have been an alcoholic. Okay. Yeah. You know, most of my cousins and uncles and relatives were, and and mostly that's because of rebelling against you know church principles. Unfortunately, I hate to say it. I don't know why it happens that way because. There's a percentage of people that that's just how they take that stuff. Yeah. There's some people, like my a couple of my cousins, that you know became devout Christians yeah. and they're very obedient, good people. I love them; they're great humans. Yeah. But you know, for a lot of us other people in the family, it seemed to go the other way. And I know for myself, I wasn't really in, 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 given a choice. Yeah. I was going to drink alcohol well, when my it. friends started drinking alcohol. You don't know, like that when you're not given a choice. You got it. I didn't know what I was doing. At 10 years old, I started smoking cigarettes because it was cool. You know, it was rebelling yeah. against my parents, but it was all so cool. You know, and, and when you dangle stuff like that, like, the gangs have all got it going on. They got the bling going on. They got yeah. the gold jewelry going on, the fancy cars, the fast women. They got it going on. It so when you're a young person, <laughs> when you're a young person, what choice yeah. do you have, you know? I mean, you don't. You're you're going to rebel against your family yeah. and, the, and the religious and the strict stuff. And and who's going to who are you going to hang with? You're going to hang escape, with somebody. So that's drugs. It's right. right. It's hundred percent true. Yeah. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. and and the people that get involved with it do so because that's yeah. just their life unfolding. Yeah. And, you know, it's they're easy choices to make. It'd be hard not to do. Yeah, church right. family part too. Really it would have been a, a near just, impossible uh, for me to be don't. different than what I was growing up like that. I was just responding. To what was going on in my environment yeah. based on who I was. Yeah, when you're a little kid. Just a kid. Man. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I've tried to, yeah, I've been constant. Through. And that it sets your whole life, right? By the time you're six, seven, yeah. eight years old, your whole life is, yeah. you know, who you're going to be. Yeah. You know, you're going to be that person. split up like a hundred times by then. Like, literally, man. And we moved over a hundred times before I was ten. Like, literally. Wow. Yeah, from Las Vegas down to Kappa Skating and uh, breaking all over, man. People yeah. should. People are, they should hold themselves responsible for who they are. But we as a society should just do our best to help people be the best yeah. people they can without the government fucking nanny state yeah. and all the, you know, the rest of it. If people aren't hurting other people, let them, let them be who they are. If they're hurting other people, we need to have ways of trying to correct that, that, that is not what we got going on, which is not, which is to demonize and criminalize and cage uh, and penalize the way that we do it. If people are hurting other people, it's usually because there's something going on with them and their upbringing and their environment yeah. and who they became and who they are. And, and the truth is we shouldn't be hurting other people for our own sake. Like, you know, if yeah. you hurt somebody else, you just hurt yourself. Yeah. Unless the exactly. bastard deserved yeah. it. You know, if one of these guys, you know, yeah, we're all you know they set those guys up in the movies all the we're time. Straight you hate, you hate while. those people. Straight so they're okay up. to... But, you know, <laughs> other than that, you know, really, I mean... Uh, if you're a scumbag that goes around ripping off, you know, decent people and, and just hurting people because you yeah. don't care or don't understand, you know, that's no way to live. That's no way to be. You're not being your best self and you're not having as much fun as you could have. Yeah. And, and so the, the best way to live is to be a nice guy, you know, to, unless you want to avoid people and send them, you know, so certain people you don't want to be nice to. I guess that has to happen, but that's yeah. a whole other story. Yeah. For the most part, it doesn't take much to be kind to each other, but when you're being kind to somebody, you're being kind to yourself. When you're helping somebody, you're helping yourself. When we're here, uh, you know, trying to help a person that needs to be rescued from a, a life of trauma and pain, 
and, and spiraling into poverty and drug addiction. When we're doing that, we're the beneficiaries of that. You know, sure, we're, we're focused on trying to give that person a, a new it's hope a human and, need and what have you, but it gives yeah. us a lot, yeah. you know. So, yeah, that's, that's my rant about, you know, let's just... Well, let's check things. it out then. Yeah. Let's go see what's going on at the, at the Healing Wave RV. Oh, giddy moment here. <laughs> hey, Kato. You didn't come on the show. He's oh, such a good boy. Yeah, he's a good, very good one. Um, there you go. Yeah. We'll get you something soon, right? Downtown Vancouver, BC. Downtown East Side. The uh, epicenter of the uh, epidemic of the overdose crisis. And uh, what we got is uh, <laughs> the, the Healing Wave RV, the cannabis substitution program, has now evolved over the years to come to, uh, to be in an RV. Six days a week, eight hours a day. This started four years ago uh, at Van Du with a table and a couple of boxes full of edibles that uh, evolved into uh, a, a beautiful team of volunteers that would show up every week, uh, twice a week for, well, once a week for one full year, twice a week for two and a half years after that. Uh, long lineups of people, 300 people. We give out over 300 care packs of four to six edibles and a couple joints, all driven by donations from wonderful, generous, caring people, all handled by volunteers that, that fade, never failed to show up and, and do a wonderful job of caring for people. Uh, that turned into having a storefront where we got to offer our CSP program six days a week, uh, eight hours a day, uh, turn our project into a program, uh, and re register the people that uh, were part of what we were doing. Uh, we have 250 people registered in that program. They get 420 milligrams every four days of high dose edibles that are procured by us as the cannabis substitution program and donated to us by a variety of different people who help us uh, with the program here. They are selfless human beings that are doing such wonderful good here. But uh, after four and a half months of being in our storefront, uh, booted out uh, due to a tenancy uh, eviction and now in the RV out front of where the store was and operating our services from here. Low barrier access point for cannabinoids at the side window and the uh, cannabis substitution program being offered at the back there. Uh, I won't show you now because we have a, a person there accessing the program but there's a, a big tray with a whole bunch of cookies and muffins and gummies and capsules and all the other things that people might want, CBD, THC, varying potencies, they get to choose 420 milligrams. We track everything they, they choose so that we get to get a sense of what's working good for people, what's working good for individuals, whether it be CBD or THC, and what dosage works and what types of uh, edibles they like and that they prefer or that they won't use, and all of those sorts of things we get to find out here. There's a lot of uh, data being collected. Uh, this is very much a research project, and uh, we continue to gather reams of information uh, to help the governments make good choices about uh, prohibition and about allowing and supporting what it is that we're doing here uh, so that we can show how we're helping people. Um, let's go inside and say hello to the crew. We're going inside. If there's space for you guys, you're welcome. He admitted everything. Hello. The ceiling's a little low, but the uh, seats are comfortable. So the spirits are high. As long as the spirits are high, the ceiling is low, the seats are comfortable, and uh, you know the mood is always good. Customers are nice. Almost always nice. They love us being here. That's very cool to hear. Customers aren't always nice out there in the world, so it's good to hear that they're always saying, "How are you doing?" We helped them whatever way we can. Yeah. Yeah. I got off a whole shitload of garbage meds, and I'm like, "Do you want like we're doing a live pot TV broadcast right now? Do you want to say a few words? Are you okay being on camera? All right. So stick your head in here a little more." What's your name? My name's Patrick. Hi, Patrick. And what were you going to say there about being on other meds? Well. I actually just did over a match. decade in jail, and I did 11 years, 8 months. That's 6 weeks after I got out of stroke. I thought I was having panic attacks, I was having TIAs. 
So I got all these fucked up meds and all this crazy shit and trying to deal with the fucking, the government criminalizing mental illness and fucking weaponizing skin color and legitimizing yep. violence, you know? Yep. Democracy is about two equal opposing sides of few having a dialogue, not a monologue. Yeah. And limits on what right? can so even be discussed. Authority, that's... Yeah, and I'm all about having some good limits. From the medical marijuana and the stuff here at the... Like, it's amazing. I got, like, I completely quit all the medication. Uh, sorry, and do you have flour right now? Very nice. I never bought Thank you, Patrick. I yeah. appreciate okay. that a lot. Yeah, we got uh, MK Ultra, five bucks a gram. We I like got... the squishy... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a common tale that we get here all the time. And uh, people are very thankful that we're here. They're very happy to find us. Very nice. Uh, we do have uh, a cap on the, on the people that are in the program. We only have 250 people that we've been able to help uh, at this time. And there's quite a waiting list of people that would like to get on that. And until we get... Uh, you know, more stability, maybe some government funding, um, the ability to open a bank account because our society would then be uh, uh, getting federal permission to exist, whereas now our society, our mission statement is about uh, delivering cannabinoid therapeutics to help people in their lives. And uh, as soon as we try to open a bank account, they need to see our society uh, papers and our mission statements and all of that. And they say that, uh, you know, they, are you going to be providing cannabinoid therapeutics within the cannabis? This act and while well, we're hoping to but uh, no we're not yet and while well, until that happens sorry we won't open a bank account for you one bank even wanted uh, several hundred dollars as a non-refundable uh, investigation fee so to uh, check us out and see if we would uh, comply with what they thought we should comply with and whether or not we would get an account we of course didn't waste that money but uh, we're hoping that all those things get worked out in the not too distant future now yeah no it's been uh, over four months since we put in our uh, our application to the federal government. Uh, we didn't hear anything back from them for over three months before uh, finally we got a conference call uh, where they were very positive and supportive in saying that they were thinking that they would be able to have uh, what we needed to be able to continue uh, in early January. I guess I should have asked them what January they were talking about because it wasn't this January that uh, has come and gone now. But, uh, you know, all kidding aside, uh, it should be very, very soon that they actually do that for us. And so the, the continuing saga of the quest for a community-based low access or, or easy access, low barrier community cannabis shop is continuing without resolution uh, for this week. Uh, week by week, we uh, update the situation, uh, hoping all the time that uh, the, the upcoming show will be the one where we get to announce that uh, we've been given, uh, uh, you know, licenses ultimately is what we're looking for, but uh, realistically, uh, an, a ministerial exemption, just, just a piece of paper with a signature from the, the Minister of Health, Patty Haydu, is probably all we would need to be able to get a license from the city to continue on until the other licensing was figured out but uh, that hasn't happened yet. So unfortunately, the show continues to be just a, a repeat uh, pretty much week oh, after week of uh, where we are yeah, and how we got here and uh, what we're hopeful for. And, uh, you know, it might happen uh, maybe tomorrow, right? Uh, maybe tomorrow's the day that uh, I look in my email box and there's, uh, there's a letter from Health Canada saying, all right, uh, you know, you guys can uh, keep on doing. You know, we're not, as I, as I stated in our conference call, to the people at Health Canada Special Exemptions and Licensing Division that, uh, you know, we're not asking for permission to do something. We're asking for the ability to continue doing something that we have been doing for four years now with great success, with hundreds of people that we've managed to rescue and hundreds more that are at our doorstep looking to be rescued. Uh, we don't turn anybody away, by the way. Uh, I like to make that point that uh, because our donators are so good that uh, we are able to make sure that everybody that comes to the window that uh, is looking for something in, in that they're in need, they're, they're drug sick or they're, they're hoping to get included in the program, that uh, we have uh, one or two or three cookies or muffins that uh, have you know fairly high doses to them and uh, we don't send anybody away empty handed for sure. And the people that come here that, uh, you know, are, are broke and, and hurting in their life. I mean, we give lots and lots of joints out all day long to people as well. So, yeah, we're not, we're not uh, saying, hey, here's a good idea. Can we do it?
we're saying, here's something that we knew was the right thing to do. We've been doing it for four years. We've had doctors and experts and community leaders and the other community groups all approve and support what it is that we're doing here. Uh, we just need to be able to do it without fear of, of raids, without uh, being, you know, through the winter time in a cramped RV uh, with limited pe access for people and, and not a safe space like our storefront was for people to be able to come into and, and feel a sense of home and a sense of, of, of security. Uh, this needs to be remedied. Uh, our governments have the key to that. We. Uh, we will do what we have to do to continue, but what we would like to do is just be able to have the federal government and the municipal government uh, permit us to do what we have demonstrated for four years to be not just effective, but highly safe as well, with no complaints, no troubles, no problems, even with high dose edibles, even with people eating too much on occasion and going through an uncomfortable time period to get to the other side of that. There's been no harm done. There's been no complaints lodged. And, and we've literally handed out millions millions, like over 10 million milligrams of high-dose edibles. We've given out well over 100 pounds of dried cannabis uh, through the program here. And uh, there's not, not been any problems, but there's just been a steady stream of people that come and thank us for what we're doing, that tell us what we're doing is helping them in profound ways, uh, wishing us all the best, uh, curious and wondering why it's taking so long for us to get back in the store, why the government won't support what we're doing here when they know and we know and the whole community knows that this is the right thing to do, this needs to happen here. Uh, people absolutely need to have low barrier access to good quality cannabis that's reasonably priced, uh, which was just part of low barrier access. And, uh, you know, hurry up, government, please. And what you can do out there at home, it doesn't take much. It's actually really easy. And when you sit down at your computer and you figure out the address to the, uh, the federal health minister or to Health Canada, and uh, you get their email address and you send them a little email, uh, it doesn't take very long. Pretty soon it's like, well, that was in the past. That only took like five minutes. And I wrote them a little email and said, hey, I really support what these people are doing and please license them or please allow them to continue. Uh, many of you have been touched by the opioid crisis and you have good reason to want to urge our government to allow for uh, a real safe, viable option for people, for all of our sons and daughters that are here or may end up here. Uh, we need to have cannabis, high dose edibles, good quality, high quality concentrates, uh, reasonably priced flour available. Uh, as an option so that if they, they end up in this area or if they end up in, in the area of your town where there's a dealer on the corner that's got meth or other things that they might be uh, wanting to have that uh, that real close by and, and really popular is also a, a real nice store that people can walk into and for similar amounts of money come out with a similar product except without all of the problematic side effects and, and, and get cannabis high dose edibles and concentrates or, or flour uh, as an option instead of having to resort to what's available easily on the corners that uh, will numb the pain and will get people through another night but it'll trap them where they have to go through a physical re uh, withdrawal to get off of and it'll trap them into doing all kinds of things to have enough money to get what they need to continue to continue to continue to continue because it's so difficult to stop. They need to be able to get off of it and that's what Cannabis High Dose Edibles offers. They need to have easy access to a storefront to, to be able to get that and that's what we're waiting for, that's what we're hoping for. We have serious hope we can get that and we'll see what happens. So that's so much of me and not enough of other people and what are you guys all doing back there? So this is the crew, Jen and George and Andrew, holding down the fort. How was your day? It's good. Yeah. A great day. Had a great day. Lots of people coming to get the program. Sure they are. We had it's, lots of people coming. Uh, we had a full page. We had a woman that comes by that normally asks for a free cookie, and uh, she brought a friend of hers today to get some CBD because she recently had a tumor. I see. Yeah. So she was very proud to bring her friend here because she really could probably provide something that would help. Nice. There you go. Have a good day. Yeah. So fairly busy today? Pretty decent, yeah. yeah not bad. Not crazy place, yeah. busy, but yeah. A good steady stream, that's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
Is it it rained real hard for a while, but it's now it's just been cold. Right, I've got a page full of CSP. They have one that has a next page. Okay, yeah, one and a half pages of CSP. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, we still got some wedding cakes and black cherry punch. Yeah, people quite what, what do uh, people black like from the CSP? Good. What's the favorite thing? Like? Six gummies. Six gummies are the favorite yeah. thing? They're the, they're the favorite yeah. thing. People yeah. like the five milligram gummy balls. The gummy balls are the favorite some thing. Some people come in and just take cookies. Right? You just say, give me a peanut butter cookies or a chocolate chip cookies. Right. So it's a pretty good selection for people? There's quite a few selections. I got some caramels at 150. I got cookies at 80 milligrams. I got three different types of cookies at 80 milligrams. Right. I got uh, gummies, five milligram gummies, 50 milligram gummies, 100 milligram gummies. Nice. I got uh, Rice Krispie treats at 60. I got muffins at uh, almost five 60. Grams. I got some CBD at 30. I got some CBD gummies too at 150 milligrams. Beautiful. 30 milligrams each. Beautiful. I got a wide selection for everybody to choose from. Nice. And everybody should make a selection. They just, if you take one, too many of one thing all the time, you get used to it. Change it up a bit. If it's not working. Well, you for try you. to encourage them to do that. Anyway. Yeah. If it's not working for you anymore, change it up a little bit. Exactly. I'll give everybody two. I got 255 people on my list of, of CSP members. I'll give them 200 milligrams of gummies. Yeah. When they come, so I have a room for, so I have enough for everybody. Right. And they can and they can choose something else. There's yeah. quite a selection, right? And, and and lots of people they choose yeah, what they want, but some other people they just want you to choose it for them. But you, yeah, you give them a bit of a hard time about that. Well I say they say, Can you give me a mix? I'll say, Well, what would you like a mixture of? Right. Right. And, and you write everything down, don't you? you I write it all down. Yeah. So you record everything to. that they take so we know what they've Thank taken. Every, on the days, the the days and the dates and when they took it and when they've had it. So I can look back and see if they if they've come on the right uh, four, yeah. every four days, right? Yeah, and all corresponds to their membership number. Yeah, sure it does. Yeah. I look it up. So it all works pretty good that it's way. Very good. People love it. Yeah. You know? They couldn't ask for better, right? It's true. It's a great program. <laughs> so how's your day been, George? That's not been bad. Got a good haircut there, I see. Yeah, well, I had to get it shortened. Yeah. And I figured I better go do it before the city decides to close down every other building in town. That's right. <laughs> Hair haircuts are rare, rare commodities sometimes these days. Well, people definitely notice. Lots of people are like, you get a haircut. Yeah. Let's see. How you doing, better? How's it going? Good, you? Good. Jen's hard to talk to. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, she's busy all the time, and I try oh, talking to her, and she's like, and George can take over. "Yeah, you want to do that? We can, we can do that." Because I'd like you to give us a rundown of what's going on and what you got over there. All right, there you go. I don't like plastic, so. Okay. <laughs> George, Be gone. Thanks. Have a good night. He's here every day. I'd say that guy's here. Eh? Pretty, Pretty much. much. Just about. There's a lot of people that come every day. There is, yes. Yeah. You see a lot of the same faces. Regular, regular people. Right. Yeah, watch your eye. Jennifer Nelson, Frumpy. author of the blog. They're just going to call it the blog. The blog. The blog. The, if you haven't seen it yet, you got to go see that. Go to the uh, Cannabis Substitution Project page on Facebook and look for the daily blog by uh, Jen Nelson, and you won't be disappointed. And you'll know why I think it's the blog. And I'm putting this on as a shout out to Carly Thiessen to thank her for my sweater. Oh, Carly's <laughs> great. Yeah, I'll shout out to Carly too. With the little cat pouch, honey. See? You know you're a crazy cat lady when this is the sweater you get. And you are a crazy cat lady. Proud of it. And proud of it, which is part of the crazy. You know. Uh, do they attack you when you get home? Mm, no, I usually have a big mess I gotta clean up that they make. They make a new mess every day. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm getting my place in order to the point that they're not making as nearly as much of a mess. That's anymore. the way you organize now. Yeah. That's how I have to do it in the shop too. I have to think, okay, <laughs> if I put this on this, is Cato going to knock it down? Yeah. And he does find things to knock down and every time he does that I'm like, oh, okay, well that was my fault. Uh, he's just being a cat and it's up to me to make sure that he can't to be a cat knocking my stuff over. If I well yeah, it's good. They're making me want to get my house clean. So. Good. <laughs> Because cleaning your house is always a good thing. You know what they say, you're in a clean, yes. clean mind is a clean life or something like that. I don't know what they say. They say lots of things. I don't even know who they are. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever have a clean mind. Though. <laughs> a dirty desk is the sign of a dirty mind. Is that something like that? Like I say, they say lots of things. I don't, I don't even know who they are. So. Well, exactly. They just, they just keep saying shit and I just keep, I just keep repeating it for the hell of it. Because why not? i got to say something most of the time. So what do you got over there for people? Like when they come in and say, do you have any edibles? What do you say to them? We got gummies and hard candies and chocolate bars and caramels and hickory sticks and cheesies and honey and infused olive oil. 
We got so much stuff. So some people, they want the strongest stuff. What do you mm -hmm. tell them? Oh, yeah, we got Damien's strong cookies. Go, so how much are they? You have an AC Seven bucks each. Three and for and 20 how, or five for 30. And how much uh, cannabis is in them? Approximately 260 milligrams each. Okay. And, what, what and we had one guy that, yeah, he like... Came and bought some today, and I was excited yeah. to get those. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, the, the rundown of edibles. Uh, we have concentrates. Yeah, we got shatter, we got hash, we got keef, we got diamonds, we got live rosin, we got oil, we got, God, I don't even know. <laughs> we got vape pen cartridges, we got tears from heaven. Topicals? Yeah, we got cream. Uh, we got MJ cream, and then we got uh, Mary McCarty's salve for sale as well. Suppositories? Oh, we do, yeah, four bucks each. Th THC milligrams. suppositories? You know, so calm your ass down. Calm your ass down. <laughs> and uh, and we have, calls it butt candy. <laughs> and we have flour. What kind of flowers do we have today? We got some good indicos. Yeah, what are those? We got some uh, wedding cake. We got some black cherry punch. Mm -hmm. We got. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Harambe God. Harambe. <laughs> harambe. Harambe. I like to call it Harambe sometimes. Harambe. Like, harambe. <laughs> I, think, I think. I mean, it might be named after the uh, the ape. The gorilla. That, yes. Uh, the gorilla That's that uh, had the little girl fall into the enclosure, and was sort of cradling it. And you know, they they feel that probably he wasn't going to hurt her, but uh, they shot him. And, and his name was Harambe, I believe, and so maybe it's named Better. after that. Chris so Lexi anyway, go ahead. Takes out for Harambe. <laughs> Apparently, that's a thing. Yeah. That's a thing. <laughs> I don't know. So we got to Harambe. What else you got? We got some MK Ultra right now. MK Five Ultra, bucks. Master <laughs> Push. <coughs> oh goddamn! Right around you somewhere. It's probably over that mess somewhere. There. There's a lot of coughing that goes on in the uh, RV bubble. I don't know what to do with it. You gonna be all right? <laughs> yeah. What are you smoking there? It's a mix of a bunch of indicas and some a little bit of sativa. You got concentrates in there? No. Okay. <laughs> and a little bit of the one dollar stuff even. So yeah, keep on going. The MK Ultra. You got the um, Orange Pico. No, that's not indica. No, no, I know it's not indica. Okay. I, I, I thought we were just okay. like naming, naming uh, weed now. AK-48. AK-48. That's it's so debatable. Jack Herrera, it's a little bit dry, but you know, just throw in a little fucking orange peel and you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> oh, uh, triple berry punch. Some triple berry punch. And then uh, there's uh, some $3 house blend. Well, it's getting to the point that uh, yeah, we're almost set aside for yeah. rolling joints. So. I see, and then there's some $1. A little bit of black domino. $1 so. grams. Yeah, that's very popular. And that is that is something that I really wish we could get kind of a donor for, because that is something we kind of need to have a steady supply of. We have a lot of people that rely see, on that. Let me see that. To be able to afford to. So yeah, that's the one dollar. Stretch out their money. A gram of cannabis that's there. Maybe we've actually had to put a limit of ten grams on it now yeah. because it sells out so fast, even at that. Yeah. So we limit it to ten grams. We don't tell the wealthy people about it. They, they want to buy the more expensive stuff anyway most of the time. But if they really knew, I mean, this is very crystally, extremely crystally, uh, very tasty. It's quite nice. And so, uh, a flashlight on it, so it's nice and bright. You can actually see the crystals. Yeah. So we've been able to maintain a one dollar gram for quite a while you know well we do few, run out we few, have periods a few of, times we run out and it's always out, down right. to it but this uh, is the nicest one we've ever had though yeah, yeah this is beautiful pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. If you put the light you put your butt, put the light to it you can see the crystal okay so you have a good job I do I can say we have a very cushy job <laughs> That's totally what I should Pun have said. totally you intended. A, you have a cushy job. I do. So, I mean, it's demanding. I even sure sit on a cushy blanket, and you know, we smoke some cushy weed, and yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. Evening. I get that now. I get a cushy fucking sweater yeah. as a birthday gift. <laughs> Car Carly's responsible for this one for me too. Oh yes, lovely. Most yeah. of us have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? George, George, George one has one to too. over there. I have one somewhere at home. She probably just sent one to Jared. <laughs> he did pay for that a long time ago, I believe. <laughs> Back in the summer. <laughs> She's good though. She, as soon as she found out what was going on, she was all over. Hey man, we all forget things here yeah. and there. <laughs> so whether you try to make it right and how you know what your intentions were to a large extent. Yeah. So, a little bit of slice of life in the Healing Wave 
You have an CSP, the RV, did reefer you van. The giant you the donation right. that we I received. did, yeah. I did. And, uh, you know, we're just sort of crossing our fingers. We're not holding our breath, but we are crossing our fingers. It makes it a little more difficult to dispense things, but it's important that we keep them crossed, I think. Or, I'm not going to cross so, my paws. You're not crossing your paws? Well, I got my fingers crossed, see? Yeah. Half gram for 15. Yeah. And, and what it takes is for other people to help us, I think. Well, we really need some more edible donors, because, yeah, our lovely Mary McCarty gonna, is leaving we're us. We're going to lose Mary, month. that's true. Shout out to Mary. She's Make it sound like she's going to die, but no, Half she's grand? just moving away. She's taking our project <laughs> east and uh, going to do fine things there as she does wherever she is. We're going to miss her a lot. Uh, both as a personality and as uh, someone who's been supplying us with a lot she, of uh, cookies and muffins. She gave us a really muffins. high compliment no, the other day. She said uh, uh, you know, she has traveled yeah, the country yeah, and we, we have some of the most like, like real actors. Oh, yeah, that is not nice. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we are going to need more donations uh, for the CSP <laughs> as always. It's it's, it's donation driven, yeah. and we don't even really give credit okay. properly yeah, yeah. anymore to the people who donate yeah, we'll do um, a little bit, dollars. but not not like we should probably. And maybe we will uh, think about that in the future. But well, I give uh, thanks to Mary all the time on my sure. Posts, but there's a lot of people that donate, and there's a lot of people that are that are well, responsible okay, yeah, for this. Know, that uh, you know, <laughs> and I don't I don't even start naming names now because. I know there's a whole bunch, and I don't want to offend anybody and leave anybody out. Yeah. But I also know that the people that donate to us are just really superhuman beings that don't do it for the, the notarization. Uh, some want to be anonymous, others don't care. Yeah. And uh, it's really awesome that we have that going on. So yeah, we're going to need some more of that. But we need to get this license. We really need to get uh, an exemption at least to begin with. And that's something that, uh, an average, that yeah. everybody can help us with that. And, and that's a powerful thing to do. I mean, if we get that, then we can make a huge difference in this neighborhood, in your neighborhood, in, in the world in general, in, in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of ripple effects that would, would happen if we could establish low barrier access uh, community cannabis shops um, here and everywhere else. So that yeah, if you want to help, like I say, it doesn't take much to write an email to, to the Health Canada or to the Federal Health Minister or to your local mayor, to, to your local police, to our mayor, to our police, to anybody, everybody. What are you laughing at me? Okay. So, um, you know, there's just things like that that you can do. And, and you know, you people are really creative and, and you can you know there's things that you can do here. Um, you know, just a phone call here or there to the right media outlet about what we're doing or, or to the right government office or, or who knows, if you can help an activist out there, if you can help get cannabis edibles out into your community where they're needed, um, just continue to, to help uh, promote the truth where you are um, and, and counter all the lies that we've been told for all this time. Uh, Saving lives with cannabis should be front page news. It should be front page news. <laughs> every the, day, every week. <laughs> this commodity, the, this substance, this natural plant in our society or our, our lives in our world, it was prohibited with the criminal law and, and millions and billions of dollars has been spent, spent ruining people's lives, lying about it and right. saying, you know, that it made people violent and insane. And when that didn't fly, then it made them stupid and lazy and on and on it goes. This plant is the best plant on the planet. This, this yeah, plant loser. will provide us with nice textiles and, and so much more food, medicine, fuel. And, and, a, and a sense of well-being and right now it's at the leading edge at the very forefront of being able to recognize whether or not you are a free human being and whether or not public servants are working for you because if your public servant is working against your ability to have reasonable access to cannabis then you're not free and if they can prohibit this amazing plant that never kills anybody as opposed to other plants that all have that ability. Well, that's et cetera, what et cetera, et cetera. frustrates me about our government or the city, whoever the hell it is that pays, pays for it. But they're willing to spend like millions of dollars providing needles and tourniquets and all of those kind of supplies. But they could spend a fraction of that money on right, cannabis. Which, <coughs> which reminds me, the federal government is now putting, I think it's $15 million out there to help uh, with <laughs> the... Uh, the safer supply <coughs> strategy, which means that they give a bunch of money to pharmaceutical companies to come up with, uh, you know, untainted uh, different opioids that uh, that get people addicted but to so them. But that's my point. They want to continue the addiction. Yes, here, please I know. keep using. Please, please. Well, so many people are making money off addiction. You know, they really are. It's really, really sad, but that's the truth.
that so many people are like making money off of and addiction. That, obviously, that's why they're stopping us. <laughs> yeah, for those people that have these other alternatives that make them money, I mean, we're not welcome. Because even like all the clinics down here and so just, much, <coughs> almost you everything can walk down, down here that, is based you can around addiction. Stand in a line up down that lane and get needles. I um, get all kinds of free You can stand in, in that <laughs> alley. There's a doorway. You can get methadone. Um, you know, there's pharmacies all over the place that have the methadone thing going on. <coughs> there's street dealers everywhere as well. But as far as the ones the governments are involved in, there's remember, lots of things uh, you can do. A few years ago, well, I guess maybe a decade ago, when I was living in the shelters, um, yeah. uh, lots of clinics were actually <coughs> paying people <coughs> to come to their clinic to fill their methadone. Of course, because they get money for every time. <laughs> I, I was like, well, gets, why don't gets, I get paid for any of the shit that I'm on? It <laughs> gets very, <laughs> very corrupt. Yep. And, uh, yeah. and I heard even some of them would like, come and pick people up and take them all the way out to like Surrey and shit like Send that. Send a van around, <laughs> pick people up and, uh, and, and make the money off and them. And it's just ridiculous. I was it's... like, how is this okay? Like, how is this going on? <laughs> and here we are saying, trying to say, look, we've got a way out for people. We've got an actual solution here. And yet we have all kinds of trouble getting the media to pay attention to us or governments to support us. Yep. Yeah, well, it, like Patrick it's a was huge saying, story. he's getting off of Smoxon, right? And... Just, yeah, because he messaged me asking if we could help him out with anything. I was like, yeah, come by, man. Like, we've always got at least we've a always got here. something for you. Give him a couple of cookies, you know, and a joint. Yeah, it's our mission. Yeah, we definitely, especially when we know it's helping somebody get off of other things, definitely we want to make sure that we can help them. <coughs> We do want to provide access for people just for all kinds of other reasons that cannabis mm -hmm. is beneficial for. Obviously, but there's the only so much we here, can do. The spirit of what we're do, here for is about, to, is about helping that. people with addiction on opiates, for <laughs> sure. That is yeah. that is the main spirit of what we're doing here on the downtown east side. A yeah. side benefit is is that we're also here available for people who have medical needs or daily use needs or just mm -hmm. you know don't have money but they're not addicted to drugs. They can also come here and get help. But the real spirit of it is, is, is you know, this is oh, a way off of opioids uh, during an opioid epidemic of death yeah. and we're still struggling over four months since we applied with an emergency application <laughs> that was designed to keep us from getting evicted we've been evicted for over 13 weeks considers urgent. <laughs> yeah it really People dying is, uh, is not urgent for them it really is exposing. oh if you're dying from covid that's urgent apparently but, you know, the overdose crisis has been going on for years now that will never, ever apparently be considered urgent. <laughs> Not urgent enough their, yet. Their only idea of them... Far their, from urgent. Well, like I said, the only thing they're offering as help is <coughs> other, needles. Other and, pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. Or other opioids coming through pharmaceutical companies yeah. that, that will benefit greatly and by supplying they're opening them. more rehab centers or detoxes All paid for by taxpayers. Because like, all the ones that do exist have wait lists. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people just give up. <laughs> they do. They, and they have to show up clean, and that's hard. Yep. And, uh, you know, or like you get into a detox, but then you have like two weeks in between to wait before you can get into the rehab. And yes, you're expected to be clean when you get there. And it's like, well, how do you expect them to stay clean for two weeks? Yeah, it's really when hard. When they're, they're just staying somewhere either on the street down here or at a fucking shelter down here where they're surrounded by the fucking same drugs that they're trying to get off of. The services you know? do not appear to be designed to really help people no. get off. No, <laughs> not in the least. And, uh, that's really, really sad. And that's why it's amazing when you do hear any fucking success success stories. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a time twister. <laughs> um, well, we're a success story waiting to happen. Yeah. Sure you know, are. we've been a success story up hey, to this point. You know what? We're helping tons of people become success stories. Yeah. And, we've uh, had so many people talk about getting off alcohol, cocaine, fucking... They might not yes. permit us, Everyone's but they haven't home. been able to stop us. Nope. No, 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 no. So it might not be permitted, <laughs> but it is still happening, and uh, they not, they're not going to stop us anytime soon. Uh, there's several different things that we can do, depending on what they decide to do, if they do decide to not allow this, and they're going to try to stop it again. Uh, you know, they won't succeed. We will eventually win here. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of it. That's, uh, that's what we got going on. Uh, we need you to help us by contacting whoever you can contact on our behalf. Uh, just further the message. Every one person at a time, that all helps. If there's one person you know that needs to be uh, educated about how cannabis can work to help people get off of opioids and yeah, that it's very effective. Highly educated. Yeah, you know, just, you know, if, if, everybody, if, if a lot of us do their part and if a lot of us uh, do this type of thing, then uh, we can make this happen. And it'll be a much kinder, gentler world <laughs> when this happens. And uh, that's what we're striving for. Uh, in the meantime, 
uh, you know, after you send your email, write your letter, uh, when you get up tomorrow, there's another pot TV show going on. Greg Williams has thrown into the influence. Marijuana Man, the longest running pot TV show, <coughs> 26 years or so. I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a very long time. And uh, he's an awesome dude who has a great uh, perspective on things and will educate you in ways that you will be surprised about. I'll bet you if you've never watched his show. Uh, on Thursdays, uh, BC Bud Gal has a wake and bake show called Morning Glory. And uh, BC Bud Gal, I'm sure, will help you get up and get into the right, uh, right attitude for the rest of the day. On uh, Fridays, Johnny B has uh, How's It Growing. Uh, has uh, always got a good guest, or maybe not always has a good guest, but he has some really good guests on there. And uh, he'll help you grow, and that's a really important thing these days, because we're all allowed to grow, but even if we weren't allowed to grow, uh, we all need to grow because overgrowing is what we're doing and that's what's working and so we all still need to overgrow and Johnny will help you do that. Uh, boss Lissa, I don't know if she's had her show much. Uh, I haven't seen it in a while, but it's still it the, the day is ready. And you can watch all the previous episodes. It's One always high noon at noon, but there's not always a Pot TV high noon show, but there might be coming up in the future. Uh, so watch out for that. And uh, Mondays, we got the 420 Lifestyle Show with uh, Carly Marley and BC Bud Dow. Very fun, entertaining show. Tuesdays, uh, I'll be back with uh, more of the THC show, Truth, Hope and Change. But uh, really, it's morphed into the continuing saga of the quest for a community-based, low-barrier access community cannabis store. The community's in there twice, but that's what we're doing. And uh, we will continue to update you as, as we go about uh, uh, what's going on with that and whether there's more threats and interference from the local police or governments or whether the federal government has uh, finally decided to allow us to save people's lives here in ways that are uh, quite obviously uh, effective and profound or whether we're still waiting to get permission from public servants who are much more interested in protecting the interests of uh, r wealthy licensed producers and, uh, and government uh, non-medical stores than they are in allowing uh, low barrier access to help with the overdose crisis. So anyway, uh, check back in next Tuesday and uh, find out where we're at with that. And in the meantime, uh, go about your life being as safe as you can in this uh, strange and dangerous world, uh, which also means you got to be uh, careful to stay as sane as you can, as uh, people can get a little crazy when things go sideways. And uh, as you're being kind to yourself and being kind to others, remember always the most important thing is to have as much fun as you can. See you next week.